What did he say? Did you say anybody I want? Anybody? Can you hear me? Anybody you want. Well, let me tell you something, my friend. It just so happens. I thought this might happen tonight. Let me tell you. I've got my first round draft choice here tonight. Who you got out there, Lawrence Taylor? I want to bring him out and show him to you right now. Mr. Kevin Green. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Kevin Green, former All-Pro. He was in the Super Bowl last night. <laughs> you people. What's with him? You know who I am. But you don't know why I'm here. He's done it. He's been there 13 times. Well, 15 if you're counting. We're not talking about those two championships. Those were not wrestling championships. You go get anybody you want. Because we... What do you mean we? We are taking over. You want to go to war? You want a war? It's Bob Bamber. Welcome to the Wrestling 20 Years Ago podcast. Going back in the time machine to May of 1996 of Volume 1 of this month's show. Volume 2 is your WWF show. Looking at In Your House 8. Volume 3 is your ECW show. And when we record it, Volume 4 will be covering UFC. We're here in Volume 1 to discuss Slamboree and WCW. and being joined by Jeff Parker. Jeff, good afternoon. Hey, how's it going? Uh, Jeff, you can kick us off with the news. All right, so Scott Hall returned to WCW in a memorable angle on May 27th edition of Nitro, calling out, among others, Billionaire Ted, the Nacho Man, and the Ken Doll look-alike, Eric Bischoff. Hall was treated like an uninvited guest, walking out during a Nitro match and just grabbing a microphone. Eric Bischoff on commentary refused to dignify the comments, but did say Hall could return at the end of the show if he had more to say, which he did. He said to Bischoff, uh, tell billionaire Ted to bring three of his very bre- best because we're taking over. The whole angle is leading to a tag match at Bash at the Beach in July, seeing uh, the as yet unnamed Hall teaming uh, with Kevin Nash and likely Lex Luger against the WCW team of Sting, Randy Savage, and either Giant or Ric Flair. The whole angle was the highlight of an otherwise completely uneventful Nitro that night, one that marked their formal move to Nitro being a two-hour weekly show. The show had actually been shunted two hours earlier during due to the NBA playoffs on TNT and lost out heavily ratings-wise starting at 7pm. But the extended show starting at 8pm will provide them an hour-long lead-in before Raw starts and will also generate more programming fees from TBS. WCW hosted Slamboree this month, a mammoth 15-match show that crowned Diamond Dallas Page as the Battle Bowl winner and recipient of a WCW title shot at the next pay-per-view. The show, which was completely uneventful, saw all the name acts in the tournament eliminated in the early rounds, leaving DDP probably the best of a horrible bunch in the tournament final. Elsewhere, the Giant defeated Sting to retain his world title. Dean Malenko retained his cruiserweight title. And Conan defeated Jushin Thunder Liger to retain the U.S. title. The show was memorable for the continuation of the Ric Flair storyline with Randy Savage, along with setting up Flair and Arn Anderson against Steve Mongo McMichael and Carolina Panthers linebacker Kevin Green for the June pay-per-view. Page was stripped of the title shot the following night that was inexplicably given to Lex Luger. Malenko picked up the title in a pre-tape match for WCW Saturday night, defeating Shinjiro Utani, who was the current title holder, but hadn't appeared on WCW at any stage prior to losing the title, on TV anyway. Uh, the Giant is still taped to be WCW champion for shows in July, but reports from tapings also had woman bring out the WCW title with her to ringside for a match between Ric Flair and Brad Armstrong. That is probably just a red herring. Uh, and Big Brother's latest gimmick is that he is a biker, that is ahead of their pay-per-view in August, it's Sturgis and Men on a Mission are reportedly slated to debut next month. We move on to the ratings of the past month. On April the 29th, we ordered a 2.9 to Nitro's 2.1. This was the first of three Nitros that had aired earlier due to the NBA playoffs. 
Made a 6 or Raw to a 4.1 rating, its second highest ever. Nitro earned the night did a 1.9. On May 13th, Raw did a 3.5 to Nitro's 2.3. For the rest of May, it was all Nitro. Um, on the 20th, a 90-minute version of the show ended up doing a 3.1 to Raw's 2.3. And on May 27th, the first two hour Nitro and the return of Scott Hall, Nitro did a 2.8 to Raw's 2.3. Nitro has moved to 7pm for the NBA this month, starting on May the 6th. Hugh Morris attacks Randy Savage during his entrance for their match. Morris dresses up in Savage's gear and starts impersonating him. This sets Savage off, who seems to take Morris down by gouging him in the eye. Savage ends up being disqualified after choking Morris with his jacket before hitting a big elbow drop, laying out the referee. The segment is made worse by the fact they ring the bell for a good minute continuously. Savage body slams the ref, then drops an elbow on him. We end up with a bunch of officials and four police officers coming out. The ring bell is still going. Heedon says, give up Randy, take six months to a year. They put a note on the screen about the passing of Ray Stevens, including a number you can call to donate to the Qualifier Alley Club if you want to make a donation on his behalf. Very classy, that. Eric Bischoff randomly announces Shinjiro Tani won the Cruiserweight title. This actually happened back in March. Ric Flair walks out during a match between Dean Malenko and Jushin Thunder Liger. Malenko wins with a Tiger Bomb that Eric Bischoff teases calling a chicken wing. A nice short match. We get pro from Flair goading Savage. He says the Giant got lucky but he's otherwise unfettered after his title loss. He's even drinking cocktails. Flair says he'd love to have a cocktail with Miss McMichael. Steve's wife is conveniently at ringside. She gets the cocktail and pours it on the floor. Steve defeats Lord Stephen Regal with a lovely double underhook suplex bridge. Flair is having a banquet on the r with Elizabeth and Woman. They're saying Lex Luger isn't here for his main event world title match. So who's out to replace him? Hacksaw Jim Duggan prizes if you were guessing that one. This is a sloppy match. Giant wins cleaning with a choke slam. Giant continues the attack post-match. Cobra sprints out and eats a choke slam, as does Alex Wright. Ric Flair runs out with a wooden chair and breaks it over his head. Giant just no sells it. Sting comes out and starts attacking Giant by taking him out the back of the knee. Uh, he comes out to a aiding Flair, which is quite interesting. Sting finally takes him off his feet and goes for the Scorpion Deathlock. Surprisingly, they don't make us wait until the pay-per-view to see him turn him, but Hart ends up hitting him with his megaphone. Luger beelines it out there wearing a pinstripe jumpsuit. We end the show with a promo from Luger and Sting. Sting ponders, ponders whether Luger deliberately didn't turn up for his match or he didn't want to face Giant. We run out of time with those two bickering. On to May the 13th, we start with a clip showing Lex Luger camping outside of the arena in Nashville to ensure he doesn't miss his title match tonight. He's even swatting a fly at one point. We open up with the Steiners against the public enemy. Eric Bischoff announces that May 27th will be the first two-hour Nitro. Decent match this. Rocker Rock does a flip, side, flip dive onto the outside, but Rick moves and Rock flattens grunge. Scott hits Frankensteiner, and that's enough for the win. Chris Benoit pins Squire Day Taylor with a dragon suplex. We join Gene Oakland outside of the building with Brownie Savage, who's been barred from entering. Savage tries to get in and Steve McMichael comes out and confronts him. Mongo cuts a promo promising to do something about Flair. Savage says he doesn't mind dragging Ric Flair's carcass to ringside at Slambury if it wins means winning the lethal lottery. Ric Flair defeated VK Wall Street after a surprisingly even match. He even needed the help of woman to give him leverage while in the figure four to pull it off. Anything for heat, I suppose. We get Logan vs. Giant in the main event. Eric Bischoff references Yokozuna by name when saying Giant would stood the elbow that, quote, took Yokozuna off of his feet and left him laying for ten minutes. Ric Flair is having a banquet, woman and Miss Elizabeth at ringside. Giant very diligently, diligently clears the table of cutlery on the outside and food before chokeslaying Luger through it. That looked really nice and incredibly painful. They don't make tables like this in many other places. Jimmy Hart climbed on the Giant's back to stop it, inflicting further damage on Luger and Sting runs out to tend to him. They end the show on quite a sombre note. All right, we're back on WCW Monday Night Raw. We are in Nashville, Tennessee. We are live, and with me at this time is the Macho Man Randy Savage. He has been barred from the building. He is persona non grata here. And, Randy, I've followed you for your entire career, and in my opinion, the train's in town. In my opinion, you have lost it. What's the deal, man? Hey, wait a second here, just a second. Wait a minute, man. If anybody in the WCW can sympathize with what you're going through, it's Mongo, baby. 
Ric Flair, you done made a mistake now, darling. It's all right going out and getting your publicity on my behalf out in the front of the whole world. But when you come back in the locker room messing with family, baby, you made it real now, darling. And I'm going to do something about it. Macho, just chill out, baby, because I've got a plan. All right. Easy does it here. Just a second. Come on. Hey, you're not going to be allowed in there, Randy. Forget it. Yes. Doug Dillinger, please. I have business left here. Can we talk, as Joan Rivers would say? Randy Savage, I want to say it again. Come here, please. Don't walk away from me. You have lost it. Lost what? Your mind. Let me tell you something. I'll tell you crazy. You ain't seen crazy. You ain't seen nuts. I'll talk to you in another lifetime, but not this one. I'm going to take the WCW and turn it upside down. You got it. Well, it's of late. As of late, upside down a little bit. But uh, Randy Savage uh, finds the Magic Johnson to Dennis Rodman. Those pale yours by comparison. I don't care about the money. I don't care about the money. Do you understand that? Who said that? I don't care about the money. I'll reiterate You're that. You're you understand gone. that? Don't tell me where I'm going no, because no, no, you I don't can... know where I've been. Randy you Savage. don't know where I've been. You are going to have to coexist this Sunday. I was there when the gals drew the names of you and the nature boy, Ric Flair, as a team. In the lethal lottery. If you want to get to Battle Bowl, you're going to have to make it happen with this man. Wait a minute. I don't have a problem with that at all. I don't mind dragging a dead tag team oh, partner to the ring. You are on a lot here. Because I'll win the lethal lottery and I'll do everything I got to do to get where I got to get. You understand that? I, I don't know if I understand uh, or not. Please, Randy. I draw a woman psychiatrist, yeah. And she said I was an OCD one cool dude. You understand that? Let me have to. All right, I should point out that WCW officials have told this man to seek behavioral help, whether it's a psychiatrist or some kind of counseling. I don't believe he has done it. Stay tuned. We are live in Asheville, Tennessee. On, and there is up. more WCW Monday Nitro coming up after this. Don't go away. Uh, we'll come back in for the review of Slambury and we'll actually start with the main event at Ed Price. Uh, we start WCW main event with an R-way interview with Ric Flair, Wynn and Miss Elizabeth. Flair says coexisting with Savage tonight is all for the love of two women. Flair makes an effort of kissing the arms repeatedly of both woman and Elizabeth. Does this look like a dead man? In relation to Sarge's comments uh, from the night trial, I think it was a week prior. Uh, Sarge appears on the video wall. He says there are no guarantees. He's Flair's tag team partner from hell. Flair leaves Sarge with one for Pretend like I woke up this morning with your wife. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. We are live. It's Slamboree. It's the Lethal Lottery. It's Battle Bowl. You can be part of it all by calling your cable company right now. A major story breaking on the WCW hotline as we speak. Earlier this afternoon, back in the locker room area, I heard the rumor that one of the major players in professional wrestling may not be doing a deal you know where. He may be going elsewhere. Now, allegedly, this man is going to be making that move momentarily. I heard it from the guys back in the locker room area. This is where I get a lot of my information. And if you want to hear all about it, I want you to get on the hotline right now. Give us a call at 1-900-909-9900. That's 1-900-909-9900. Everything that leads us into this spectacular note of slamboree on the hotline tonight. I will now read a Mean Gene Oakland hotline plug verbatim. A major story breaking on the WCW hotline as we speak. Earlier this afternoon, back in the locker room area, I heard rumour that one of the major players in professional wrestling may not be doing a deal you know where. He may be going elsewhere. Now, allegedly, this man is going to be making that move momentarily. I heard it from the guys in the locker room area. This is where I get all, a lot of my information. If you want to hear all about it, give us a call now. Jeff, can you make head nor tails of that? Well, what's the old saying? It's like telephone, telegraph, telewrestler. So I guess maybe Mean Gene has the scoop. Uh, and obviously they want to make some money off their hotline. I mean... But you've got to give something, surely. I mean, I've got no idea what he was plugging here. I think someone's either coming or going, arriving or leaving... And it might be sooner or later. Uh, Someone you know, that you may or may not know making that move momentarily. I think calling him Scheme Gene or whatever might work sometimes. I think it's a little, uh, 
I think it's it's a little lowbrow at times that uh, hotline. Well, he's done a lot worse. I mean, I go, you, you go back to that night on WCW Saturday Night about fourteen months ago, where he basically said, "Call the hotline to find out if Ric Flair's dead." I mean, he's he's done a lot worse. It's just that usually I can like work out what he's angling at. This I don't even know that he knows. Um, I don't know. Just. The whole hotline thing's a bit weird. I don't really understand it. He makes money off conning people. I suppose that's what that is. But you would you would think that, it, you know, give us something, Gene. Anything. Anyway, we get our first match of the evening with the American Males against Shark and Max. That's two X's. This is the former Max Muscle with Jimmy Hart. Eric Bischoff actually calls him Max Payne at one stage. Shark picks up Riggs in a cross body position. Max takes the pairing down with the right hand and Riggs ends up pinning Shark. Out comes the Giant. Shark turns on Max. Giant and then chokes up Shark. That actually looked quite good. Um, Jeff, you, as you've seen this show, I mean, we, we've seen the pre-show guy, you know, main eventer comes out and cleans house. We've seen it with Vader. If you want to look at ECW, we see it quite frequently with guys like the Sandman, with guys like 911 back, you know, back last year, uh, very early part of this year. I don't know that I want my world champion cleaning house in a pre-show match, though. It kind of brings him down a bit to me. You know, I, I actually, I kind of, I, I dug seeing the giant chokes on a guy that big. Um, you're right. You don't want to overexpose a guy who's supposed to be a special attraction. Also, if he's supposed to be a heel, I don't think you want to see him, you know, getting a pop. Um, because he was obviously cheered for doing a really cool kind of high spot that you don't really see the shark going up for. Um, I, I don't know. I think, I think the giant has a, has this kind of once in a lifetime talent type potential because he's like a Shaquille O'Neal build. He's not an El Gigante skinny tall guy. And he's a lot more agile than Andre, and he looks great, you know, to, to, you know, not to steal anything from Luger, but he's got kind of a total package in a way if they can protect him. And, you know, maybe don't put him on the main event, uh, or include him in a, or even mid card guys like Shark and, and Max Muscle, you know, like I, maybe, Again, you got to protect him. It's all about perception, and you want him perceived at a certain level, right? So yeah, I, I, I would say it's less about him being in this spot. We've seen Vader quite effectively used last year in WCW in this kind of spot. I think it's just more. I want to keep Giant only messing around with name guys. I don't want Giant coming out. I don't want Giant. What I don't want people thinking that the Giant gives a shit about a match between the American Males Shark and Max. The Giant should be well above that in more ways than one. That's what I would say about that. It was effective. It's a nice spot choke climbing shark. I mean, I suppose it would have been better left to the the match they had on Nitro. It was all right. Anyway, we get a promo with Kevin Sullivan and Chris Benoit on the R way. Benoit says he's never liked Sullivan, nor has he ever trusted him. But fate has united us tonight, and I'm going to put my differences aside for this one evening, because the gold belongs to the horseman. We get a promo from the Road Warriors. They're on opposite sides this evening. We also get a promo from the Steiners. They tease some tension. Scott says he's older, but I'm the bigger brother while flexing. We end the show with a promo from Sting and Luger. Giant interrupts from the video wall and taunts Sting. Ask your buddy Lex Luger what it feels like to be in the ring with the Giant. And we move on to Slamboree. Jeff, you want to kick us off with the results? All, Great. all 15 of them. <laughs> So the first match of the night, uh, Road Warrior Animal of the Road Warriors and Booker T of Harlem Heat fought Road Warrior Hawk and Lex Luger to a double count out in a lethal lottery tag team match. The Public Enemy defeated Chris Benoit and the Taskmasters Masters Kevin Sullivan in another first round lethal lottery match. Rick Steiner and the Booty Man defeated Sergeant Craig Pitbull Pittman and Scott Steiner in another first round match. VK Wall Street and Hacksaw Jim Duggan defeated the Blue Bloods of Stephen Regal and Squire David Taylor in another first rounder. Dirty Dick Slater and Earl Robert Eaton defeated the Disco Inferno and Alex Wright in yet another first round tournament matchup for the Lethal Lottery. Diamond Dallas Page and the Barbarian defeated Ming and Hugh Morris in another first round lottery, Lethal Lottery match. Uh, we then had Fire and Ice with Scott Norton and the Ice Train defeating Big Bubba Rogers and Stevie Ray of Harlem Heat in a Lethal Lottery match. 
Uh, Ric Flair and Randy Savage with both women, woman and Miss Elizabeth at their side, uh, defeated Double A Arn Anderson and Eddie Guerrero in a Lethal Lottery tag team match. Uh, getting a break from those, uh, Lethal Lottery matches, we saw Dean Malenko defend his Cruiserweight Championship against Brad Armstrong. We, uh, then unfortunately had to go back to more Lethal Lottery, Lethal Lottery second round matchups with Dick Slater and Bobby, oh sorry, Robert Eaton defeating VK Wall Street and Hacksaw Duggan. Uh, in another second round Lethal Lottery matchup, we saw Public Enemy defeat Ric Flair and Randy Savage by forfeit, um, as Savage and Flair just fought and it was a whole schmoz at the entrance ramp. Uh, Dallas Page and the Barbarian defeated Rick Steiner and the Booty Man in a Lethal Lottery tag match to advance to the Battle Bowl. We then got a break from the tag team matches and saw uh, Conan defend the U.S. title against Jushin Thunder Liger, uh, which Mike Tanay did some nice guest commentary on. Uh, we then had the Battle Bowl itself, in which Diamond Dallas Page defeated Barbarian, Ice Train, Scott Norton, Public Enemy, Dick Slater, and Barbarian. Did I say Barbarian? Yeah, Meng was probably the one you're missing out. Uh, Meng, uh, no, Meng got eliminated. No, it was Bobby Eaton. So it would be Barb, Bobby Eaton, Ice Train, Scott Norton, Rock a Rock, Johnny Grunge, Dick Slater. Sounds about right. Like it mattered. <laughs> like it mattered. It mattered so much they changed it the next night. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then in the main event of the evening, the Giant, uh, World Champion Giant defeated Sting. Uh, to retain his world championship with both Luger and Jimmy Hart handcuffed together at ringside. Oh, this show, this show, this show. Jeff, what do you think? You know, I I think the silver lining we often look at is over 34 guys from the tournament and then adding the singles matches. They all got paydays. They all got on the card. Uh, you know, any, any night these guys are working is probably, you know, nice to see, you know, just, you know, for the business. Uh, guys getting exposure. I, uh, I actually happened to have oral surgery while I, after, uh, just, sorry, just before I watched this card. So I was actually under anesthetic when I watched it. So maybe I enjoyed it a little more than most, um, cause it was just wrestling that was on. Uh, I just, the booking was just crazy. Just nonsensical. I don't ever want to see two booty man matches in one night. I don't ever want to see... I don't ever want to see one Booty Man match in a night, yeah. let alone two. I mean, just just painful. When you look at the roster, I mean, realistically, you could have done, you know, half as many tag teams and actually booked it with good guys and had a way better tournament. And, you know, maybe let some of your main event talent or your high paid talent go past the first round. I mean, it's not like they're doing a job at the end anyways. They're going to get tossed over the top rope. Um, I just, I just, this was just a total head scratcher with four non-tournament matches that, so, um, we can go into more detail, but yeah, it was, it was nice to see guys getting on the card. Scott Norton, Ice Train, Dirty Dick Slater, Earl Robert Eaton, Johnny Grunge, Flyboy Rocco Rock, Diamond Dallas Page, and The Barbarian are the eight men in a finale of a match that will, in theory, crown the number one contender to the Giants World Heavyweight title. Well, it wasn't Giant, was, if Giant was still champion. And would let us know who would be in one half of the main event of the Great American Bash next month. Uh, yeah, as you say, Jeff, that's, that's really bad. That's, re- that, those are your, those are your eight. Um, and it says a lot that, Jeff, when was Jim Duggan over in Louisiana? Are we talking late 70s here, early 80s? When was his run over there? Uh, mid 80s. Right, okay. 84, 85, 86. But probably before Watts went bust, uh, and then had to sell to Crockett. But, I mean, that was the one thing you can see on the card. The fans, the stuff the fans were popping for was a lot more of that brawling type. I think the schmoz at the end of the first, uh, match between the Road Warrior and, uh, the Luger and Booker match. Uh, you know, you can, you can kind of see there's that kind of tone. Uh, but yeah, Duggan, Duggan was probably one of their, uh, top five to top eight biggest stars they ever had for Watts. Yeah. Um, he was probably one of the top five guys on this show in terms of crowd reaction. Um, yeah, there were certain names this crowd were into, and then there were a lot of names that they just couldn't give a fuck. 
Um, and it showed. Anyway, we will start with our review of the show. As we say, 15 matches officially, 14 technically. This is going to be a long review. <laughs> Tony Schiavone says we are at fever pitch this evening because fans are going to see things they've never seen before. Is that a promise, Tony? We're in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Tony Schiavone, Bobby Heenan and Dusty Rhodes have the call. We open up, as we say, just to formally introduce the Battle Bowl concept. The Battle Bowl Knockout Tournament is a wild card tag team tournament. We have eight first round matches involving um, eight matches, four guys in each, 32 guys. Um, then eight of those teams, in theory, will progress to the next round, the quarterfinals, if you like. Uh, 16 men, four matches, and then... Four of those teams will progress through to the Battle Bowl final. The eight-man over-the-top rope uh, battle royal, which you apparently can win by pinfall as well, even though they never explained that. Um, and the winning person will be known as Lord of the Ring, will win the Battle Bowl trophy, and will get a shot at the World Heavyweight Champion at the Great American Bash. So in theory, in theory at least, quite an interesting tournament. But as we've seen before, as we'll see tonight, not so much. We open up with Road Warrior Animal and Booker T versus Road Warrior Hawk and Lex Luger. Luger is limping a bit. Does seem to be selling the chokes down through the table from Nitro on Monday. If you haven't seen that, that was a great spot. Um, they build those tables well over at WCW, given how hard Luger went through that one. Um, Booker gets a pre-match kick in on Hawk. Things break down as Animal has to play bodyguard. The eventual winner of Battle Bowl uh, win the Battle Bowl ring, Crown Lord the Rio have done that. Uh, Luger powers on Animal, but decides to pose to the crowd rather than pin him. Animal runs Luger over with a clothesline and hits a power slam of his own, then a shoulder tackle. Luger suplexes Animal, who no-sells it. Animal tags in Booker, who just shoves him away. The pair exchange missed elbows. Booker T spins to his feet, then hits a jumping side kick for a two. After a long rest hold, Booker T hits a scissor kick on Luger's head. Hawk breaks up the pin, but that sparks a brawl between Hawk and Luger. Animal jumps into Hell Court. Cork and this turns into the Road Warriors against Luger and Booker. The fans seem far more interested in this than they were in the match previously. It ends in a double countout. Jeff? You know, I, I think it's fairly inventive when you book what if matchups, like what if Hawk fought Animal, who'd win? What if Rick fought Scott? And I think, I think there's kind of a lure or draw of seeing guys fight each other that you'll never, or will, you've never thought you'd see them fight. Uh, the Royal Rumble did a couple spots like that over the years. You had like Axe versus Smash, or they kind of tease those things. Uh, the problem that it breaks down though is, you know, from a wrestling psychology point, it's kind of poor when you think tag team partners would rip each other apart for a singles title shot, despite the fact that they're a team and would ostensibly be gunning for tag team gold and wouldn't want to hurt each other and kind of are going towards a collective goal. Um, this this match really kind of struck me as odd for mainly the, uh, the booking of Luger here, because he's obviously one of their top guys, and he's being included in the giant Sting feud, and he's been chokeslammed through the table, and they didn't really include him, uh, you know, include that angle when they're trying to sell this match, and they just did this smodge finish, you know, nothing, there was nothing from here to add intrigue to the main event, um, because the Road Warriors aren't breaking up anytime soon, so it, it kind of felt like a cop-out finish, and, uh, I think it, I think it would have been cool, and this is just me being, you know, a, a brilliant fantasy booker, but, uh, I, I would have liked to have seen one Steiner and one Road Warrior versus the other Steiner and the other Road Warrior in the first round, if you're gonna do a double countout, if you're gonna do a, a double DQ or whatever, because that's something, you know, that's one of those what-ifs, you've never seen that. Um, I liked the finish. I thought it had some nice fire and uh, everybody saved face. But, you know, the, another thing that really stuck out to me is when you put the Road Warriors in there with a guy who looks as great as Luger does and a guy as large as Booker, their mystique, you know, of what, or whatever is left of it kind of dissipates and they kind of look um, ordinary. Defeated. Part of, yeah, ordinary. Like, I mean, that was the whole, the road warrior pop and the road warrior, you know, mystique was about no selling and, and just being the most roided up guys on the roster. And here they are with Luger who has like, you know, less than 1% body fat and Booker T who just, you know, does these incredible, you know, what is it? The, the break dance into the, the spinning sidekick. I mean, uh, it kind of makes these two guys in face paints who are getting up there in age look just kind of ordinary and deflated. It was, I don't know. In a way, it, it's it's not the best way to book the Road Warriors, considering probably what they're being paid. No, I mean, I almost wonder whether even WCW thought maybe it's a bit obvious if we do Rick and Hawk versus Scott and Animal. Maybe even they went, yeah, 
maybe we shouldn't do that. The match was all right. The crowd weren't particularly into it. As you say, I think there was a bit like this and a bit like in the, the match with the Steiners in a, in a little while. They were kind of waiting for the, you know, we, we, you, it's one of those things. When you telegraph this kind of match, you tell the audience to wait for the bit where the two tag team partners face each other. So they kind of sit on their hands until they do. And then... They, they got up when the match broke down. It ended up being the, the Rope Warriors teaming against the other two. But obviously that didn't really help the match. I like, you know, as you say, the, the idea really, and, and God knows we could have done with it, should have been Luger wants retaliation over the giant for choke slamming him through a table on Nitro. He's going to do everything he can to get through this tournament and win it. And God knows, as we saw from the results, he probably just should have won it. Um, and, and also, and, uh, and we said it at the top of the review, is that we're looking at the final eight. These are four of the maybe top ten names in the, in, in the tournament bracket, if you like. Top ten, top twelve, that kind of thing. Eliminating them all at the same time was not a smart move. But anyway, this will still go down as one of the more eventful matches of the round of 16. We move on. This entire show, the, one of the flip sides of them trying to get through so many matches is that it is just match after match after match. They don't waste any time on this show. Next up, it's the Public Enemy, Flybo, Rocco Rock and Johnny Grunge versus the Taskmaster with Jimmy Hart and Chris Benoit. Benoit and Rock start with a shoving match. Rock surprises Benoit with a head scissors who shoves him down. Benoit sets for a powerbomb but Rock rolls through into a Frankenstein. We repeat the spot and Benoit slams him hard with a powerbomb. Benoit tags in Sullivan but Grunge gets involved and the match breaks down into a four-way. There's a table on the outside. Grunge holds Sullivan on the table. Rock takes a run-up but in the ring but Benoit cuts him off. Rocco Rock suplexes Benoit over the top to the outside. Heenan asks why that wasn't a disqualification. They lay Benoit on the table and drape Sullivan over him. The public enemy do their PE sandwich spot. Rock crashing Grunge through the table through Benoit after Sullivan moved. Sullivan limped off with Jimmy Hart and the public enemy pinned Benoit to advance. Jeff, what do you think? Um, another, que- I-, I questioned why Sullivan and Benoit didn't get, uh, furthered into the tournament. I think, uh, I think that's that, dis- if you're, if you're booking dissension and you're booking feuds forward, why is the, what's the, what's, what good is the public enemy going to be if they're not going for the tag titles? Which by the way, I mean, Luger and Sting are the tag champs. Um, so they're not really selling that the win, you know, these tag teams are going after the tag champs. It's all about, well, they want to win this Lord of the Ring. It's, it's kind of the antithesis of what you want in, in a tag team pursuit. Um, you know, Benoit exudes intensity and realism. Uh, Sullivan's the antithesis. You know, uh, everything Sullivan does looks like he's swimming in concrete to me. I don't, I, I don't like seeing Sullivan in there. Uh, all four of these guys, I think one, a part of, during the match, I noticed, I think all of them were in the ECW at one time, kind of together, maybe not working together, but they all kind of had that root, and you kind of saw that that brawly type style. Um, one thing I thought was interesting on commentary was Dusty's doing commentary, and they're even talking about Dusty's biggest opponents and if he had to tag with them, and and they didn't even mention that Kevin Sullivan was one of his biggest feuds down in Florida, you know, throughout the whole thing. It was just this this lapse of logic, even the finish. Why wasn't Public Enemy DQ'd there after sending a guy through a table blatantly in front of the referee? Um, you know, as, as, as much as disinterested as I was in watching Sullivan wrestle, uh, much like the flair and, and, and savage tag, tagging up, I, I mean, going forward in the tournament, why not put Benoit, who's a worker, and Sullivan in there again and just have them working longer because what are you going to get at a Public Enemy at this point in a, in a match? Uh, it's just, I don't know. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of that this show. I can say that for certain. Yeah, um, you know, it, it's one of those things where Taskmaster, for you know, for good or for bad, probably for bad, is one of the more noteworthy names in this tournament. I mean, you, you might be thinking with two matches in, the names are going to get a lot worse, and it's kind of like they almost did a rod for their own back, putting that match on first and this match on second in that you have four guys in the match, four guys that really, you know, if this, if this had been the final eight in the, in the battle Royal, 
that would have kind of made sense. You'd have gone, you know what, we've got a tag team in there. we got Taskmaster, who's the leader of the Dungeon of Doom. we got Benoit, an up-and-coming guy. we got Luger, who's kind of, you know, the de facto babyface in all of this. We've got, um, who else have we got? Well, Dominant tag team in history. Yeah. we got Booker T, who's a young up-and-comer, and Public Enemy, who are a proper tag team. And the Road Warriors, who are a proper tag team, if they got their five different methods. This is the final eight would have been about right. I think it would have been, it would have accentuated the random nature and it's a bit of a mixed bag, but you would have got to that and you would have gone, okay, well, I'm cheering for Luger. I quite like Booker at the moment. And then there's, you know, the, the rest of the guys are a bit up and down. I like the Road Warriors. I recognize those guys. And then you've got the others that fill out the match. That's the, it, this could have been the eight in the final. And instead they booked them against each other. And it's weird in the sense that, it, it, while it is a random draw, you know your book, you can book this yourself. The match was alright. It wasn't particularly, like a lot of these matches, it wasn't particularly long enough to be anything special. Um, Benoit, I'm sure, probably quite enjoyed the reprise of the Public Enemy, having worked with them in ECW last year. Um, as you say though, the story of the Taskmaster and Benoit almost would have been better told had they won their opening round match and then had it have broken down in the second match. You know, that kind of thing. A bit like, a bit like what they did with kind of Duggan and Wall Street in that they were getting through it and then it kind of broke down when they got, you know, further down the road. But, or whatever. We move on. It's Sergeant Craig Pittman. Uh, it's this Sergeant Craig Pittman with Teddy Long and Scott Steiner versus the Booty Man with the Booty Babe Egg and Rick Steiner. We start with Pittman and Booty Man. They attempt some pretty ropey chain wrestling. Scott tags in, runs over Booty Man, but runs into a slam and a knee lift. He hits a double underhook powerbomb and tags Pittman back in. Rick tags in. Pittman hits a German suplex, which seems to land Rick hard on his head. Rick runs over Pittman with a right arm. Pittman stumbles towards Scott's corner. Scott is reluctant to tags in, but he does, and the crowd wake up. Scott hits a nice fire and carry. Rick appreciated that. Scott hits a lovely side suplex. Rick levels in with a clothesline. Scott plays possum and almost rolls him up. Rick hits a German suplex. Scott follows Rick to the top and does a lovely belly to belly. Booty Man and Pittman tag back in. Pittman locks in his code red armbar. Booty Man gives a very good job circling around to Rick, who tags in and hits a German suplex with a bridge for the three. Jeff. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> Three of these guys are legit shooters, and uh, there's one guy whose face is held together with screws and metal plates. Man, uh, I was hoping you were going to say, and Rick Steiner. That would be uh, fun. Uh, no, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that to Rick Steiner's no, face. No. Uh, you know, there's something oddly grotesque about watching a guy work whose face is held together. I just Every time I watch The Booty Man, it makes me uh, kind of uncomfortable, because after the Paris Hill incident, I just always kind of feel kind of nervous watching him work. Especially when he's working with... Like as if his face is about to fall apart. Well, I mean, if you're working with somebody who's a little snug, like the Steiners maybe have been once or twice in their careers. But maybe uh, once or twice. Maybe once or twice, you know. I, I, It's just one of those things where it's like, again, you look at how... It, it, the rand, the randomness of this, of this tournament is only within the illusion of, you know, kayfabe land. We can book this any way we want. And we have the Booty Man and Craig Pittman on one side... We are on the opposite sides and the Steiners are the opposite sides. And either way, one of the most over guys in this match isn't going to go on. So I love the Steiners. I love suplexes. Uh, there were a lot of them here. That's about it. Um, my note here was Heenan on commentary seems to be entertaining himself here. Um, you, which I just th- copy and paste that for like every WCW pay-per-view we've yeah. ever recorded, I think. I mean, he's just, he's using really old jokes that were really old the first 50 times he said them. It's just, and the thing is, he can, he can really excel at commentary when he actually has some sort of investment. But, uh, here it was just, you know, did you know Rick Steiner's ugly? Cause he has 30 jokes to tell you how. Something like that. Yeah, I, I think, I, I, to an extent, I don't think you can blame him. Um, it's difficult to be motivated when the stuff on show is so drab, like this all undoubtedly is. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, Booty Man, I've said my piece about him before. Pitman's okay, but no better. Um, this was, I, I know what you mean, in the sense that this was kind of, it was the, you know, the match where one of them had to go out, and I think, to an extent, this was the one where it at least built to the bit they were selling. When they set up this match, it was, oh, what's going to happen when Scott and Rick got in the ring? And the right thing happened. They had a good kind of 
I wouldn't say intense wrestling for three or four minutes. They had a good, very solid exchange for a few minutes that showed them trying to out-wrestle each other without trying to beat the piss out of each other. And then it broke down. The finish was actually quite nice. We kind of booty man is still in the arm bar, kind of managing to tag, tag in Rick. Um, hits a German suplex with the bridge for the three. Yeah. Um, sorry, it's going to be a lot like this tonight. It's a lot like, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I thought and then just go, yeah, it was a bit short, it was alright, nothing more than that. Next up, Lord Stephen Regal and Squire Dave Taylor filling in for Finley. I think Finley was alright, I think they were just saying he was selling the injuries from the, um, from the car parking lot brawl on Nitro a couple of weeks, uh, a few weeks beforehand. Uh, there were G's against Hacksaw, Jim Duggan and VK Wall Street. The usual antics from Duggan and Regal pre-match interacted with the fans. Heenan says, we're in Baton Rouge, I'm surprised they know what USA stands for. Duggan hits a hip toss, offers a tag for Wall Street, who declines. Duggan runs over Regal with some clotheslines, then forcibly tags himself out. Duggan gets annoyed at Wall Street not wanting a tag, so he lays everyone out, uh, including Wall Street. He then takes up his fist and pins Taylor. The referee sees this and couldn't give a shit. Um, Jeff Tate fists, I mean, this is meant to be heel wrestling stuff, but if, if he's doing it in front of the ref, does it really matter? I don't know. I got it. I mean, you got to pop. I, I love Duggan. I've always loved Duggan. He's just one of my, I, I think he's a real looking guy. I think he could win a fight if he's in a bar. He comes from the mid South. That's kind of my, one of my favorite territories. He was still over on the card when he's wrapping up the, I mean, again, logic police, uh, when you, you're not even supposed to throw a closed fist in pro wrestling. So when you tape your fist up in front of the ref and do it, you should technically get disqualified. Um, you know, here it was, it was great. Regal's an awesome heel and his facials and everything are perfect to work with Duggan's limited capabilities at this point. Um, you know, they're in Watts' backyard here, so it makes sense that Duggan goes over. He was one of the most popular guys, uh, on the show outside of the worldwide stars. Um, I mean, I could have just gone with going to see Duggan once. I think, you know, similarly to the Steiners, that's that style of work that really got over in this territory and this, this area of the, of the country with Watts. So, uh, you know, that real smash mouth JR type, um, uh, work rate and uh to all the credit to regal and taylor here who uh shined in the short time they had yeah not a long match but uh, as you say we're in duggan territory even if it is 10 12 years on uh we are you know duggan is a guy i said this before i i, I said my piece last month that i think you know it it's not in 96 and we're still having jim duggan as one of the guys that can get a reaction most easily don't get me wrong it's really paint by numbers stuff but he's still getting that reaction um but you're right it is quite difficult to dislike duggan and there is such a just an obvious character you're american he comes out he waves the flag he shouts usa he's a bit patriotic he's believable he's the kind of guy you probably want on your side in the fight as you say jeff rodden on the other team um and yeah regal's Good. Taylor's all right. VK Wall Street's okay. Match wasn't very long. Yeah. Right. Move on. It's Daddy Six, Daddy Dick Slater with Cameron Robert Parker and Earl Robert Eaton with cheese versus Alex Wright without entrance music for a while and Disco Inferno. Disco begs off in the corner. He wants Slater to avoid his hair. Wright hits a drop kick and a head scissors on Tweet before hitting a side kick. Disco tags in and the match breaks down. Wright takes Eaton over the top rope. Parker distracts the rest so Slater can hit Disco with the boot for the win. Bizarrely, it seemed like Wright was on the outside trying to stop Eaton getting in to break up the pin rather than the other way around. Jeff, basically the idea for this match seemed to be wouldn't it be cool if we teamed Alex Wright with Disco Inferno? That was it. Yeah, I mean, if this were ten years ago, I mean we're looking at two tremendous tag team workers in Dick Slater and Bobby And Bobby and of course, Midnight Express. Dick Slater had an awesome tag team with Bob Orton Jr. Uh, in the Atlanta and the Georgia Territory with Gary Hart as manager. Um, they, you know, 10 years ago, this would have been incredible. Their bump cards are pretty much full at this time, and Slater especially is quite limited. Um, Alex Wright's stock just seems to drop as the days, you know, sit by. And he's with the Disco Inferno, who's just literally a Saturday Night Fever slash Honky Tonk Man knockoff. Um, I mean, it is what it is. I can't believe that Slater and Eden in 96, you know, both over the age of 40 almost, uh, Slater is way over 40 here, um, you know, advanced to a second round of a tournament in, in a modern era. It just boggles my mind. Uh, I can believe it when their opponents are Alex Wright and Disco Inferno, though. 
But who's your investment going forward? I mean, isn't Alex Wright the one with the biggest upside? I mean, it, at least he's got... Pro- probably still Jim Duggan. <laughs> it's, it's probably the short... I mean, yeah, we, we are... We're around... It's around a year ago when the right push kind of came to a halt. Um, you know, you see, I mean, you still had a really good match with... Um, Pillman on the Great American Bash in June, but it was around this time a year ago where Ric Flair got ousted from the head booking position, and Flair was the guy who had Wright's back. Um, if we recall correctly, there was the old story that Flair ended Wright's undefeated streak on Saturday night, and then kind of apparently felt so bad about it, they ended up retaping it, so it was a controversial finish, so it didn't matter. Um, but since then, you're right, and it's like... There's enough upside in right. I just, you know, it's the problem where you you push a guy for six months and then inexplicably you stop. People just don't care about him. Um, any, any, anything more, Jeff? No. no. Pass. Let's no. just an exhausted sigh. <sighs> no more for, there's half. There's another half of the first round. If there's one benefit of Steve not technically being on the show yet, it means we can get through all this a lot quicker. I'm hoping we can oh. get him on at some point. But we will move on. It's Dime Dallas Page and the Barbarian versus you, Morris and Meng. Page and Morris size each other up. Morris knocks Page to the outside, then goes for a slingshot crossbody. But Page moves and he hits the matting hard. Page hits a distance clothesline for a two. Meng has no hesitation in going after the faces of Fear Partner Barbarian, hitting a number of hard chops. Barbarian takes down Meng. Dallas enters and, barge be- uh, and Barbarian picks up Page in a suplex position and slams him onto Meng. Morris hits an elbow drop off the top, then goes back up and Page crotches him. Barbarian hits a belly to belly off the super- off the top for a two. Morris hits a lovely suplex, a uh, lovely moonsault, sorry, off the top. Page dives in to break up the pin and the match breaks down. Barbarian leathers Morris with a big boot, that was really nice. Uh, Meng, Meng, Meng pins Page at the same time. It's a double pin. They're saying Barbarian and Page won the match. They show the replay and we see Page's foot was under the bottom row, but it's also worth noting that Meng and Page weren't the legal men. Jeff. Uh, somehow one of the more livelier matches on the tournament. Um, I gotta admit, I'm a huge Mang fan. I'm a, I'm a huge Barb fan. Uh, I was at WrestleMania 6, and I saw Barbarian nearly take Tito Santana's head off of the top rope clothesline. I love his big boot. I love his, uh, top, the top rope belly to belly. How he gets up there and does that. I mean, they're all badasses. They're believable. It's my style. I like them. When Mang and Barbarian were in the ring together, I enjoyed it. Hugh Morris was doing crazy stuff. He was doing like a plancha. He did a top rope elbow drop. He did a moonsault. All very impressive for his size. Not that commentary would put it over at all because that would include, you know, trying to <laughs> pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. Pay attention. Uh, you know, it was a bit clumsy at best. It was thrown together, but, uh, you know, it was a hoss fight. Exactly, exactly what you'd want for a Louisiana territory match. You had Ming and Barbarian who could probably take out everybody in the arena at once. So I was pleased, but you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I, 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 I would agree with the sentiment that this was probably one of the more noteworthy matches in the sense, and I, I don't want to call them young by any stretch. In the sense, these felt like four fresher characters. In the sense, they felt like four characters that this match meant a bit more to. As you say, if nothing else, it was quite a snugly fought match. There was some impressive spots. Um, I thought Barbarian has a really good big boot. It really isn't helping Hot Cone at this point that seemingly everyone that does a big boot on WCW's roster does a better one than him. Uh, and that's not going to help. You know, it is helping Hulk Hogan, though. What was that? What, you know what is helping Hulk Hogan? That he's, not, that he's not on this show? Well, I was going to say when, you know, the guy who's positioned to be the next babyface to challenge, Lex Luger, isn't even in the tournament at all after the first round. I mean, isn't that kind of a coincidence if you really look at it? It, 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 what are you trying to imply that Hulk Hogan might be stifling someone else's push? I I think it's interesting that Diamond Dallas Page won the Lord of the Ring tournament to challenge when they could have heated up a new baby face. Uh, it's just it's interesting that you know Brutus Beefcake had more matches than the number two baby face that was working <laughs> on the show. Uh, uh, number two baby face probably was still Sting. Well, I was counting. I, I was counting within the uh, Sting and then Luger. But. Yeah, but yeah, but you'd be right. He, I mean, it was Sting only wrestled once. I mean, not that he could have wrestled twice. Um, but you're right. Booty Man did wrestle more than Sting, uh, Luger, Flair, Savage, because that match never got started. That second one, uh, Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit. Uh, it's quite a long list actually. Dean Malenko, 
uh, Conan, Jushin Lai. It's a very long list. Um, yeah, there are a lot of guys that there are a lot of guys that wrestle once and sacrifice themselves so that Booty Man Ed Leslie could get two matches on this show. <laughs> but that's yeah. just all. That's all, that's just all you know. That's yeah, not, that's just a coincidence. Yeah. Purely coincidental. We move on. It's Big Bubba, who's now apparently part of the Dungeon of Doom. There's, there's stuff going on on Saturday night now that I, I no longer cover, but I'll, I'll fill in on that. Uh, Stevie Ray versus Fire and Ice, Scott Norton and Ice Train. Big Bubba looks in decent shape, although I'm not sure about the bushy goatee. Ray hits a big body slam onto Norton. Norton then lays him out with a right. Bubba hits a spine buster of sorts. Ice Train tags in, hits a body slam, then jumps, uh, just jumps onto Bubba's chest. That didn't look fun. We get a double clothesline spot. Scott and Ice Train hit a double clothesline on Bubba, and that will do that. Jeff? Uh, I'm a big Scott Norton fan. I like, again, I, I like those kind of, I'm a, just think of anybody Jim Ross would like, and Bill Watts would like, I like. Uh, you know, those big houses. Um, I, I think Norton's more suited to working a Japanese stiff style against better workers who will take it. This felt kind of clumsy. There was no balance to the match. You know, four big badasses not giving an inch. Uh, I don't understand why you throw Norton and Ice Train a win here, but not Harlem Heat. I think they're the team with the better upside who clearly, uh, you know, are better workers than at least Ice Train. Ice Train's just this massive individual. Uh, big Bubble looks cool. Um, I don't know what makes him part of the Dungeon of Doom. Now that he's a biker, unless, you know, that's weird. Um, no more weird than any other member of the Dungeon of Doom, to be fair. In fact, well, fairly normal. You've got sharks and you've got, Zo- well, you had a Zodiac. Well, shark, had- shark's not in it anymore. Oh, it's sorry, he's a, he's a, he got kicked out. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. So there's just a giant, there's a taskmaster. Oh my god, I, honestly, it's just, it's, it's a, it's just so, it's, 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 it's WCW. At least it's not on Nitro. It, like if it's all, if it's happening on Saturday night, I don't watch Saturday night anymore. That's 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 out of my way. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm well, pretty sure the the next night or the next uh, one of the next Nitros, you had the Giants blow off match with Shark, and he, he did the uh, dastardly deed of cutting Shark's hair. Yeah, well that's Big Bubba, don't forget, but don't, don't spoil that, we'll, we'll come to that in the, uh, in the TV report. But yeah, that happened too. Um, yeah, the match, you, you're right, I, I, I perhaps would have, I, I perhaps would have expected a bit more in the sense that, you know, I, I strain is probably the weakest of the four, but he's improved now to the point where he's competent. You can go back a couple of years and, and watch him be really up and down early 1994, and I think they just pulled him from television and just thought, crikey, we've got to get him some, some training. But Bubba's always good. Stevie Ray's the the lesser half of Harlem Heat, but he's still fine. And Scott Norton, I agree with you, Jeff. Like, you know, it's it's just a beer barrel of muscle. That's all it is on the front of his chest. He's huge. Um, the match wasn't very long, nor did it ever tease being anything other than mediocre. But I kind of would have liked to have seen a better version of this match if they'd have got longer. Um, and that's not anything I probably could have said in any of the other matches we'd seen so far. I move on next to Eddie Guerrero and Arn Anderson versus Ric Flair and Randy Savage. There's no Flair first time around in what his music plays. Savage comes out second and then Flair's music plays again. Flair comes out and rushes down to the ring. We cut to the ring to see Anderson attacking Savage. Flair gets involved and continues the attack. We start with Guerrero and Flair. Woman and Elizabeth sneak down the aisle way. Flair takes a back body drop and Guerrero hits a nice pair of drop kicks. Flair goes over to tag Savage by elbowing him in the head. Arn starts attacking Savage. Savage fights out, which whips up the crowd. Anderson hits a nice spine buster. Savage ends up uh, in his own corner. Flair starts attacking him. Guerrero just pokes Flair in the eye. Guerrero hits a perfect drop kick, then a swinging drop kick off the top. With Flair recovering, Savage dives into the ring and attacks Flair. With that, Arn DDT's Guerrero in the ring, pulls Savage out of the ring, and Flair pins Guerrero. After the match, Flair and Anderson attack Savage on the outside. Flair brings Elizabeth over. Arn and Flair hold Savage up, and Elizabeth slaps him. Arn DDT's him on the floor for good measure, and Flair presents him with some flowers. Jeff? Uh, this was my most anticipated match of the night. Uh... Crowd felt really hot for this match. Eddie and Flair worked great together uh, when they had the chance. Great stuff while it lasted. A lot of fire while it lasted. Um, four of the best workers they have in the company right now. Uh, two of the biggest superstars in the company. Um, you know, when Flair was in there with Guerrero, they were just just hitting on all cylinders. Uh, great match. Well, awesome. 
I was glad you said while it lasted. It certainly, well, certainly wasn't a great match. Um, no, it was good. I, I think less about the in-ring activity and more just about the the shenanigans and story and kind of the way they set it all up. You know, the whole point of Flair's music playing, but Flair not coming out, and then Flair coming out second so he can set up the kind of, you know, the attack with Anderson in the ring. The match was fine. I mean, it... It kind of almost felt like they, they decided to do Battle Bowl Lethal Lottery on the basis that they had this set up in mind. And yet, Jeff, I kind of felt like this would have just been far better served as an angle on Nitro if it had just saved us the rest of this pay-per-view. Yeah, well, I mean, the whole Flair Savage storyline, I think, I mean, it, it's just, it's this protracted deal. It's, it, I like it. I like I like them working together. I like watching Honor Anderson. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like the intrigue of seeing Flair and Savage have that you know uneasy alliance. Uh, but obviously, they kind of wrote that off by having them just not show up for the second round. Um, again, you have your two biggest stars probably in the tournament, and they are out, or they're not in the. Sorry, I apologize. They're not in the actual final battle bowl. Like it's just it just felt counterproductive. Yeah, um, it all, you know, uh, another, given the five matches that preceded the first two, another match where it's like, these four would have been really good in the final. I don't know quite how they'd have got Flair and Savage to the final, but it kind of would have been worthwhile finding out how, but they got them through this. Um, I, I, I think you could have booked Flair trying to one-up Savage, Savage being insane and trying to do something. You could have had the other team, you know, in, in one of their matches, you know, have more dissension or somehow. You could have worked it. I mean, I think I think the whole idea is you want to see, you know, Randy Savage is one of those guys where you're not so certain certain that when he kind of, when his, his wire snaps, if it's not going to happen for real and he's throwing live rounds. I love watching, you know, him kind of go mad because it feels like method acting, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, there's a way to do it to, to not have ice train in, in, the, in the finals. Yeah, you're right. There, there, is, there is a way of pulling this off where you can get Flair and Savage over... Uh, that storyline more over than it was at the start without having them you know, effectively go out of this round. I know they took, oh, they got them through this thing. We say there's a way of getting them through. They did. They just had to get them through the match with the public enemy. And then to an extent, you could have done what you liked in the, in, in the main event if Savage and Flair had been in it. Um, so I, I guess technically, technically we call it so far so good until they don't get through the next match. Anyway, we move on. We kill some time with some bickering between Rose and Heenan. We get a commercial for the Great American Bash featuring a barbecue involving Sting and the Steiner Brothers. Gene Oakland is joined by Angela, Melissa and Kim from Hooters to help him do the draw for the next round. Apparently, whenever they do Battle Bowl tournaments, Oakland is contractually obliged to do some horrible on-screen flirting with some women. Reminder, a flashback to those segments with Fifi on the 1993 Battle Royal uh, Battle Bowl. That show... Um, anyway, they do the draw. Fire and Ace, uh, Fire and Ice, sorry, get a bye, because obviously the, the first two teams were eliminated, so there's only seven. Uh, they draw Dick Slate and Earl Robert Eaton against Haxel, Jim Duggan, and VK Wall Street. They want to prolong the pain, so we'll stop the draw halfway. And we move on next to Brad Armstrong versus Dean Malenko for the WCW Cruiserweight title. Now you might be wondering, what's the Cruiserweight title and what is it doing here? Right, fill in what I know. They did a Cruiserweight tournament for the WCW new Cruiserweight title, and I believe that took place entirely in Japan. And that was won by a tournament final by Shinjiro Otani, who you'll remember from Starcade, um, in, I think, mid-March? I think was about when it's won. Um, and then... Nothing about this ever appeared on Nitro. It's quite possibly they had some, some build on uh, on Saturday night. And then at the last set of Saturday night tapings, they take Dean Malenko pinning Shinjiro Tani for the WCW Cruiserweight title. Uh, and that aired the night before this show. So that was all of that. And then they set up Malenko facing Brad Armstrong, perennial job of Brad Armstrong, in this match. Here we go. We start with some chain wrestling. Armstrong goes after the arm and hits a nice kick to Malenko's head. The crowd are so quiet, I've got in my notes. Malenko slams Armstrong left onto the ring post. Malenko comes off the second rope onto the left leg, then works the submission. 
Malenko ties him up in the tree of woe, then drop kicks the leg. Armstrong slides out in a pin attempt for two. Malenko comes off the second rope. Armstrong gets his bad leg up and fire, the match fires up. Armstrong hits a big power slam, then goes to the top and hits a big drop kick. His leg is apparently fine now. Armstrong locks in Malenko's Texas cloverleaf. Malenko gets to the rope and sends him tumbling to the outside. Heenan tries to imply that people not making noise is actually a good thing, i.e. they're watching because they're appreciating the action. Blanco comes off the top with a gut buster, and that's enough to retain. Jeff? Uh, if there's anybody more underrated in this company than Dean Malenko, it's Brad Armstrong, who's been one of the most poorly underutilized or unused talents of the past decade. I'm a big Brad Armstrong booster, if you can't tell. Um... Then again, it's hard to get somebody over if they never established him as a character. I mean, I don't know what Brad Armstrong really is or who he does or, you know. I've always heard that Brad Armstrong in the dressing room was kind of the same as like a Mr. Perfect type sense of humor. Like a really funny, boisterous, Arn Anderson, Joker type guy. And it just never translates to the screen. And he just, you know, kind of comes across as bland. Uh, which I think could maybe categorize both these guys. They're great workers, but this match lasts uh, lacked heat and commentary was killing them. It wasn't like they were, se- it wasn't like they had Teneos there selling this as a, a technical clinic. Um, the, the finishing high spot, the top rope gut buster was pretty awesome, except, you know, all through the match, they're heralding the Texas Cloverleaf and he's working a leg and then he grabs the win out of nowhere with this huge gut buster, which kind of felt, uh, uh, I don't weird. Know, well, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a decent match. It wasn't gonna change my life, but I like the, I like the high spot finish. It was pretty cool. Yeah, I often talk about watching wrestling in a vacuum and it being good. This was literally like watching wrestling in a vacuum because nobody made any noise. It's painfully silent at times. I can't recall many matches we've covered. There certainly have been some, but I can't recall anywhere I've gone wow, this crowd is flat. And the crowd was flat for most of the night, and this stuck out even so. Yeah, it was, I don't know. I mean, it was almost kind of the thing where they were, when you put them through those first eight matches and you give them so little to kind of latch on to, they were waiting for something to latch on to. As an opening match, this might have actually done a bit better on the basis that it would have been, oh, good, wrestling. And they'd have gone, okay, first match out the gate. Don't know much about either of these two guys, but let's watch. They would have got into the storyline. I just wonder whether nine matches in where they were just like, give me someone I can cheer. And this wasn't it. Um, and Malenko's good, I agree, Armstrong's fine, but the big problem is, Jeff, Armstrong's a guy that, if he ever appears on che- television, invariably loses. Um, and not that I get the feeling this was the most clued in WCW crown in terms of up to date storylines and watching all the television. But Armstrong is just a perennial, not a jobber, but a perennial undercard guy. And it was a very, very flat way to kick off the new Cruiserweight title. Absolutely. We move on next. We get the Our World is About to pray, uh, Change sorry, vignette. Blood Runs Cold coming to WCW soon. We get more awkward moments with Gene and the Hooters ladies. The rest of the draw. Oakland is shocked that the public enemy are in the draw, apparently. Uh, and they draw Randy Savage and Ric Flair. Diamond Dallas Page and the Barbarian draw Booty Man and Rick Steiner. Next up, it's Dirty Dick Slater with Ken Rock Parker and Al, uh, and Al Robert Eaton versus Hacksaw Jim Duggan and VK Wall Street. And if you thought the first round matches were short, you're going to be in for some fun here. We start with Duggan and Wall Street fighting. For some reason, rather than letting go, uh, Slater and Eaton break the fight up. Duggan and Wall Street briefly tease an alliance, but it doesn't last. Duggan shakes to attack the ref. He then takes down Slater with a really soft clothesline and then an even worse shoulder block. Wall Street twice shakes the punch Eaton but ends up punching Duggan. Eaton rolls up Wall Street and they pick up the win. We get a post fight, fat, uh, post f- a fight post match. Duggan has to be held back from Wall Street. Jeff, I think the youngest guy in this match was like late thirties, like thirty eight, uh, and none of them are really getting pushed. Are you Duggan- sure? Are, th- are all these guys over forty? Uh, uh, Slater's Slater's way over forty, and. Uh, I'm pretty sure Bob Eaton was in his 40s by this, or Duggan, Duggan was. I think Eaton and, Eaton and Rotunda, or BK. How old, uh, how old are you, Let's have a look. I, I'd say he's in his late 30s at this point. Uh, 38, well done. I'll give you that. Good. Yeah, but yeah, and, probably the youngest in the match. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I mean, when you look at the talent they have on their roster, I mean, they have Chris Benoit, they have Booker T, 
They have, you know, I mean, let's, let's look, I'm it's Alex. building. Right? Sometimes we say they have Chris Benoit and he's in Japan. Yeah. Benoit was there. I mean, let's, but let's just say they think Benoit's kind of bland. You have the Steiner brothers who can suplex eternity and you're, you're, you're putting Dick Slater and Bobby Eaton in the finals of a meaningful tournament in, in 1996. Now I'm not going to take away from their careers because Slater, you know, they always said was the, the best Terry Funk impersonator coming, but he probably should have worked trying to be Dick Slater instead of Terry Funk. And Bob Eaton's in the greatest tag team of all time at Midnight Express, but it's 1996. And I mean, your, you your, have your to, CV or as you would call it, your resume can only take you so far. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about like how many bumps have they taken and Slater by this point? I mean, he'd been, he'd been up and down the, I mean, the roads for so many years. But you got these tag teams, you have the Steiners, you have Harlem Heat, you have the Road Warriors, you have Ning and Barb or whatever face of fear. You have the American Males, you have all these teams, and you put these four guys in the second round match. I mean, good grief. Creative just creative needs to get a little more creative here, I think. Needs to get creative at all. Yeah. Um yeah, yeah, you know, like who who am I supposed to not even me, who am I as a, a viewer supposed to root for in this match? Like okay. Yeah. Pretty much. And Duggan lost. Like, sh- I, I, like, sh- <laughs> surely Abby win. Eaton's a heel, Slate's a heel, VK Wall Street's a heel. The one guy who I'm supposed to root for loses. What's and the I, point? I would like to see the last pay-per-view win Dick Slater or Bobby Eaton, Robert Eaton, sorry, even had. And these guys are pull, pulling two wins in one night. I mean, I, I bet I bet Slater won alongside um, what's his face uh, last year. Yeah, I bet they won some kind of tag match because they were tag champions last year, I think. So uh, we're looking at we're looking at very fairly inconsistently booked individuals at best. At best, at real at best. Let's move on. The Public Enemy, Flyboy Rock, Rock, and Johnny Grimes versus Randy Savage and Ric Flair. Savage's music plays, but there's no Savage. Flair comes out with Woman Elizabeth. They're handing out Savage's money. Savage comes charging out and goes straight after Flair. Half a dozen security follow him out, as do the American Males and Craig Pittman. Flair scarpers and the public enemy win by count out. Um, we won't comment about this, Jeff. I'll, I'll, I'll save your comments on the Flair stuff for when we get to his promo in a bit. We will next. It's Dime Dallas Page and the Barbarian versus the Booty Man with the Booty Babe and Rick Steiner. There's some pre-match interaction between Page and the Booty Babe. Page and Booty Man start off. They're saying that Page did lose the stipulation match uh, in February, I think March actually, um, but he's now got a benefactor who's got him back in. So that makes it Page start as a rich man, became poor, came into a lot of money, became poor again, lost his job and is now doing all right. I think is the latest in the Diamond Dallas Page story. Anyway, Rick hits a big back body drop. He gets held back by Barbarian trying to get a tag to Booty Man. Rick drops him out uh, uh, on the top rope and then tags in Booty Man. Booty Man hits a high knee, but Dallas Page is right back, right on the ball to break up the pin. Booty Man goes for a roll up. Page drops an elbow on the back of his head. Barbarian pins Booty Man and wins the match. Jeff. Uh, my notes here are Rick Steiner's suplexes are great. Everything else was flat. I've then written flat, period, and then flat, underlined. Okay. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's my, uh, analysis there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna add anything more to that. That's probably about right. We move on next. It's Juicy and Thunder Liger with Sonny Ono versus Conan for the WCW United States Heavyweight title. Mike Tanay joins him on commentary for the match. I've got no words for the Queens Park Rangers kit that Conan seems to be wearing on the way out. Jeff, you might understand that reference. Actually a Cuban flag, but boy was that some entrance gear. Just a giant Cuban flag and kind of like a cape. Uh, we get a rolling, uh, rolling bomb by Luger. Uh, Luger? Liger, sorry, that's a typo. God, that's a thought. Jushin Thunder Luger, that's a different one. Maybe that's... that guy get over. Yeah, yeah, God, it would, wouldn't it? Uh, it would get over in Japan, anyway, imagine that. Uh, Conan recovers on the outside and Ono gets and kicks in. Liger hits a slingshot splash onto Conan while he goes after Ono. Liger goes for an armbar, but Conan rolls through into a modified STF. Conan has a small K uh, shaved in, oh, sorry, uh, uncut into the side of his otherwise bald head. Uh, Liger gets in a modified camel clutch. We get back to the feet and both men exchange what Chanae calls palm thrusts. Liger hits a rolling kick. Liger hits a super perplex, then a big splash on top, only gets a two. Liger goes to the top again and goes after Conan on the floor, but Conan kicks him on the way down. 
Liger hits a belly to back and a fisherman buster for a two. Conan hits a slam off the top that bridges into a pin. The ref ha- uh, the ref's hand hits the mat for a three, but Liger did kick out, so we carry on. Liger rolls out of a razor's edge, but the pin only gets a two. Liger hits a Liger bomb, but both Conan barely kicks out. Liger comes off the top and meets Conan's raised legs. Conan hits his power drop, a razor's edge into a sit-out power bomb, and that's enough for the win. Jeff? Yeah, I think at this time, at this point of a really long card, I mean, they're trying to get the fans out of their seat with all these awesome-looking high spots. Um, I don't know if it really worked because neither of these guys has really, you know, been pushed heavy on TV within WCW. And again, you're in Louisiana and you're pushing a Japanese wrestler against, you know, uh, the Mexican world champion as they're, as they're selling Conan. Yeah. You know, I, I hate seeing Liger out there with Sonny Ono to begin with, cause I think Liger's a walking comic book character and could get over huge as a baby face. So I see a lot of counter productivity and uh, counter intuition with when it comes to their talent management. Um, you know, the fans didn't seem to react much to a lot of Liger's, you know, stuff and, 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 and like the Splash Mountain or the, the Razor's Edge that Conan was doing. I mean, the, the, they were doing these really cool looking moves and it just kind of seemed to sit there. Um, Conan's got a good look and good size, cool move set. Um, I don't know if Liger's the best for his US showcase because, I mean, you're kind of going to have to work a little more, uh, what's the word? Like, I, I think Conan should have just gone out there and crush somebody until he could get over. I don't think he's over enough yet to have a, a, a working match with a, with a Liger. Uh, Tanae did good on commentary. He obviously knows a ton and is more invested in educating the viewers, which is something, again, commentary, the other commentators could, uh, could learn from. They're just trying to pop themselves. It's easy to see, uh, you know, it's nice to see somebody treat a, a sporting contest or a wrestling match like a legitimate serious sporting contest. Um, Conan's kind of work kind of reminded me a little bit of a younger CD heel, kind of like a Rick Rude. Uh, again, he, he didn't seem to connect with the audience enough. Uh, I'd like to see him work with some more established stars to get the rub. Uh, if he's going to be the U.S. champ for much longer, that's that's my uh, indictment on the match. I liked it, but. Uh, yeah, would have been a better match on another card in front of a different audience that weren't so burnt out. I think is probably how I would sum it up. It was a nice match. I, I think you're completely right, though. Conan is a guy that needs a bit more shine. He needs a bit more exposure. Um, you know, the fact he's not American isn't gonna, you know, that isn't gonna work very well to begin with. I think that's a little bit of a stumbling block. And Liger is another guy that's featured occasionally, featured on the first Nitro, etc., etc. Neither guy's on TV enough where you can just throw them out there and expect the crowd to react. Particularly a crowd that didn't seem to be watching all that much of any WCW television based on some of their reactions. The match was fine. I agreed today was good. Um, it's one, not only is does he care enough to try and get the guys and the match over, but he also is in a position to, and I don't think Shivoni, Heenan and Rhodes are in it, are in any either of those positions but there we are um match was fine probably the best on the uh, show so far but yeah kind of forgettable even so now one small other matter of business there is a huge physical specimen in wcw whose name is steve mcmichaels now mcmichaels last week on nitro you went from being a former four or five time all pro defensive tackle, performer on a Super Bowl championship team, to making, <laughs> to making the damnedest thing I've ever heard in my life. He told the nature boy to back off. A football player talking to Ric Flair. Come on brother, listen up McMichaels. Take it for what it's worth. I cannot back up if I can't get your wife out of my back pocket, brother. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, no. No, 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 no. She followed me around. Hold on just a second, Steve McMichael. Now listen, nature boy, you've been writing them checks on my person. Well, Mongo can cash a few on you, my friend. First of all, let me clarify something. Last week you made the mistake of cracking on me, football boy, but I didn't have your enforcer with me last yeah, week. He's standing behind He's the enforcer, He's watched too. over more football players on the way to the restroom than guys you played against. And you know what? 
Let me tell you what I feel is going on in Austin. Lonely women like great lovers. Woo! Oh, for crying out loud. That is a slap in the face. Enough is enough. Hey! Hey, hey, Mr. Mr. NFL, Mr. Super Bowl, you know what? I am Ric Flair. This is the Enforcer. We're wrestlers. And if you want to get one of your old-time teammates, Richard Dent, Randy White, you want to get Jim McMahon, Brad Muster, get one of your old-time teammates. Get anybody. Walk down the aisle. Oh, oh, there's the a enforcer. challenge. There's a challenge there. Ooh, and the nature boy. They've challenged you right here, Steve McMichael. What did he say? Did you say anybody I want? Anybody? Can you hear me? Anybody you want. Well, let me tell you something, my friend. It just so happens. I thought this might happen tonight. Let me tell you. I've got my first round draft choice here tonight. What do you got out there, Lawrence Taylor? I want to bring him out and show him to you right now. Mr. Kevin Green. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Kevin Green, former All-Pro. He was in the Super Bowl last night. I said retired players. You never not said retired. You You're not one Let's go. Right now. Oh, oh, Kevin, get out Kevin here. Green get out of, here. of the Carolina Panthers. What the hell is going on? Oh, some of them. Yeah, they want to get going. Kevin Green. Kevin Green, Kevin Green, you can, you you see what happens when I'm you. I'm right not... here. I'm right here, play baby. Come on, let's rock and roll. Wait a minute now, Steve McMichael. Let's turn around and look at these television cameras. I want to assess this. You well, were challenged. Want, well, he's not going to back I don't want them skulkers jumping on my back. We want to assess this. Rick Flair challenged you. He says you get a partner. Meet Arn Anderson and myself. You apparently have thought this thing over. You better believe it, baby. You heard me say, I've got a plan. Well, this is part of it right here, darling. We're going to take these boys on anytime, anywhere. Kevin Green, you, of course, have followed the career of Steve McMichael, and you've got a tremendous career in progress yourself. I tell you what, I don't say a lot. I do my talking on the football field across this country, baby, but this is one thing I want you to understand, Flair and Anderson. We don't come to play, baby. We're ready to rock and roll anytime, anywhere. You better put your jock on. And remember one thing. You better bring your mouthpiece, baby, because it's going to be an all-day affair. Thank you very much, Sean. Okay. Steve McMichael. And, of course, Green Kevin Green, the bombshell day. tonight. Um, anyway, we get an all-way promo with Oakland woman Elizabeth Flair and Anderson. Flair says Surridge is going for a medical examination tomorrow. Flair basically says he and Anderson are going to have sex with woman Elizabeth tonight. He then moves on to McMichael. Flair says, I cannot back up if I cannot get your wife out of my back pocket. Here's McMichael. Flair gets behind Anderson and talks Michael, McMichael about his wife. Flair tells him to get one of your old teammates if he wants a match. Flair then says, who have you got out here? Lawrence Taylor? McMichael unveils Kevin Green. Kevin Green is the linebacker still playing for the Carolina Panthers. Jeff, what do you think of this? Oh, I love this. This is my favorite part of the show. This is great. I, I, I would be shocked if it wasn't everyone's favorite part of the oh. show. I mean, I mean, consistently, I mean, Flair, even though he's been, you know, kind of just denigrated for the better part of years, just doing jobs and being, you know, booked kind of horribly, he's still doing this, the, some of the most entertaining stuff. Steve McMichael has a legitimate shoot crazy man reputation. He's part of the legendary 85 Bears, uh, which are arguably the greatest NFL football team of all time. He looks incredible. He's got this awesome gimmick, just handmade of being this. I mean, he has the party animal reputation that's, you know, parallel to a Lawrence Taylor. Um, and he's got that kind of magnanimous kind of larger than life personality that he can go up against a flare and an arn. And it just, it was just so much fun. I mean, I was, I, laughing might have been too strong of a word, but I just got thorough. In, I was thoroughly entertained here. Kevin Green is another awesome crossover athlete. I'm a big fan of him. He, he's most famous for playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, it's a really interesting storyline here since everybody, um, you know, they're running really hot right now. Uh, Green's a Carolina Panther. Flair, of course, is a god in the Carolinas. 
uh, and they're still running hot with Flair Savage. I think this could get good mainstream publicity. Green is still fairly relevant. Uh, I just A plus for this. I, love oh, this. I was going to say, Jeff, can can you fill in kind of well, me, but uh, anyone this side of the pond that doesn't really follow the NFL, can you kind of fill in Kevin Green's stature in, in, in America at this point? All right, so Ken, Kevin Green is a very smash mouth football defensive football player who was part of the mid 1990s Steelers teams uh, that even went to the Super Bowl lost but I mean you can't win them all uh, he played positional linebacker he's a he's a big stout like just he's just just human muscle you know what I mean um that that was the first thing that got over me was his size because but Michael's big and green comes in it's like yeah he's about 10 percent bigger that that's imposing and he, and he was part of a Steelers defense that, I mean, while not the steel curtain of the 1970s, was, you know, highly touted. And then he, you know, he did, he did, uh, join the expansion Carolina Panthers. So that's obviously going to help w, WCW, as, uh, Razor will call it. But Ke- Kevin Green, I mean, he's in the twilight of his career, which is why I could see him doing WCW right now. Uh, and, you know, kind of looking for an exit strategy. He was also, I believe, with McMichael. They were two of the guys on the outside for Lawrence Taylor at WrestleMania 11 in his match with Bam Bam. So, uh, you know, there's obviously an interest there, uh, what they do with it. If they could, you know, do a, a six man with, you know, McMichael Green and Randy Savage versus the Horsemen, that could be just awesome, depending on where they do it, where they run. I mean, especially in the Carolinas, it could be hot. Um, you know, for all the stuff they do with Hogan and Luger and Sting, I think this 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 angle right here was the hottest thing they've done in a while. Let me see where the Great American Bash is next month, because I can't imagine they could have Green for more than one I shot. I think, it's, I think it's Baltimore. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, is it? Yeah, that's right. So, so not quite flair country, but still, I mean, that, that, that should, that should go. Where is, where is Maryland in relation to the Carolinas? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's still kind of the mid Atlantic area and flair always drew well in, in Baltimore and that, that Maryland area to begin with as, as NWA champ. Um, you know, I think, I, I think ideally if they do a program there, I mean, what, what's the, what's the main event? Probably the world title, but. I mean that's that's a hot match and and Baltimore's a good a good WCW crowd. Yeah, I mean uh, you know M- M- Michael is training. I I don't know where he's at right now. One would imagine he's still fairly limited. Dare I say we could even call him Green, I suppose. Um and then you've got Kevin Green who as he is still an active footballer ain't going to be doing all that much, but he doesn't need to. And the good thing is in Flair and Arn Anderson you've got two proper pros. Flair will Flair will bump for all and sundry for both of them. And Arn should be able to carry that portion of the match where McMichael probably needs to do a bit of selling. Arn can carry him through that match. So in many ways it's a it's a perfect kind of foursome really um, this segment was great though I mean Flair is so good the bit where but Michael comes out and Flair just stands behind our Anderson like any great heel and then because he's behind our Anderson he's full of chirp a little bit a little bit akin to say on an ECW where Bill Alfonso's not the most confident and then he gets behind Taz and all of a sudden he's got the biggest ego in the world it's Flair's really good his delivery was great and um, Michael, the, the, the one thing we'll say, and, and, and you'll know a lot more about the, the, than I will in this regard, is that while he might have the reputation and all of that, that doesn't always necessarily translate to being a great wrestling promo. And I'm not saying he was great, but his delivery here, Jeff, uh, and we, as we saw on Nitro in the month, was was more than fine. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's a he's a wild guy. I mean, that's. I, I think that'll be his gimmick. That he's, you know, uh, he's a he, he's a, a football equivalent of a limousine ride and jet flying, wheel and deal and kiss stealing son of a gun. I mean, he has that. You know, he's a farm boy. He's got that kind of wild cowboy type or modern day cowboy type deal. He's a he he's he's a party guy, and it's it's he's he comes from the greatest. You know, one of the greatest defenses of all time. One of the greatest football teams. So I think I think he he's got a lot of upside if he uh, you know is put with the right people. And we move on to the eight man battle bowl finale. It's Scott Norton versus Ice Train versus Dirty Dick Slater versus Earl Robert Eaton versus Johnny Grunge versus Flyboy Rocker Rock versus Time Dallas Page versus the Barbarian. Um, Jeff, did they say that pinfalls were allowed here? I didn't pick that up until Page pinned somebody. 
I was going to ask you the same thing. <laughs> well, uh, we'll, we'll take that as a no. It, it wouldn't be the first time WCW started a match and didn't explain the rules. It's an over-the-top rope battle royal, so I'm assuming the last guy in it ends up getting disqualified. Um, but there we go. <laughs> um, they split into pairs. We basically end, end up getting some middling action of a Royal Rumble match. Imagine a Rumble with no star power, is what I've got in my notes. <laughs> Darn Dow's page gets thrown over the top. At least one foot touched the floor. I don't think both did, though. Rocco Rock is eliminated. Slater uses his boot to eliminate L. Robert Eaton. Parker gets in his face, and uh, Eaton leathers him with the right hand. Scott Norton gets eliminated. I think Slater eliminated himself, going after Eaton, by the looks of things. And our final four is Grunge, Page, Barbarian, and Ice Train. Yes. The four contenders for the, w- the the world's most prestigious championship. Because as we know, as Eric Bischoff said on Nitro the following night, this is a world wrestling championship. What they do over there isn't wrestling. You'll have heard that quote in the introduction. Ice Train hits a clothesline. Page hits a diamond cutter on all three. He then covers a grunge. One, two, three. He then covers, uh, pins Ice Train as well. He goes for a third, but Barbarian kicks out. Page gets in the ref's face. The ref shoves him over. Barbarian hits a tombstone pile driver. Page kicks out. Page then low blows Barbarian with a boot. Barbarian hits a powerbomb. Page kicks out. There's a little bit of life in the crowd. A bit. Barbarian goes for a diving headbutt from top. Page moves. Page then hits the diamond cutter and wins the match. Jeff? Uh, painful. Painful, painful, painful stuff. Brutal booking. Molasses work. Well, five of the eight guys were well over 300 pounds. I mean, I mean, who the hell gets overworking two less than five minute matches and then this, really? I mean, uh, you know, and also you're beating a bunch of Saturday night main event jobbers and tag guys. If, if you start with 32 wrestlers and on your roster for a tournament and end with Dallas Page and Barbarian, and I like Barbarian. I don't mind Page either. If you have them as your last two, you need to tear up whatever booking sheet you have written down and start from scratch. Um, I have that the page uh, near elimination kind of skinning the cat spot. I, I have it written down. It's exactly like the Shawn Michaels Royal Rumble spot, except devoid of the athleticism, charisma, talent, or natural ability. <laughs> uh, you know, so he's got that going for him. Yeah. It mentioned in the same name as Shawn Michaels, the world champ and the other time, the other team. Uh, you know, Paige showed some spark, but the crowd was ultra dead. And it's not like, I, I don't know if, if they could have booked something better to put in this spot and it would have gotten a better reaction. But I mean, the, 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 the diamond cutter didn't seem to be over enough for the fans to dig it as a finish. And like, like we just talked about was like the pinfall. Like when did that come into, play like I I don't think the fans even expected to see a pinfall um real realistically if they sold that that battle bowl as pinfall only that could distinguish it from the Royal Rumble instead of it just coming off like a cheap knockoff but uh altogether flat brutal pointless painful uh redundant and useless well said I like you know the the only redeeming bit of this match was the bit with Paige and Barbera at the end, which was all right. It was a good, you know, I don't want to overpraise it, but Jeff, I think, I don't think, I don't think that bit was quite as painful as the bit that came before it. Um, but I almost would have just had Paige cover Barbarian and pin him. Almost just like, at least, at least in that version of the story, I, when I say that, I mean, like after he, he just pinned the other two guys and he, uh, Barbarian was laid out because he also took a diamond cutter. It kind of would have worked if Paige had just pinned him as well. At least you would have got the diamond cutter over as, oh shit, he just put three people out of that move, that worked quite well, and won the match. But yeah, this was death. I mean, as I said in my notes, this was the Royal Rumble match with the bits without any of the anticipation for anyone coming out next, and without any star power in the ring. That was what it was. It was the first four or five minutes of this match were absolutely horrendous. Between, I mean, probably the eight worst guys in the competition, really, save maybe Booty Man. No, Bobby Eaton. Bobby Eaton gets, he gets a pass. He's... Yeah, okay. Largely, largely. Yeah, Scott Orton's not bad. 
Um, I quite like the Public Enemy, but they are a tag team act. I mean, the, the, the reason the Public Enemy got over so well in ECW is because they were a really compelling team. The reason they got into ECW to be a really compelling team was that neither was much cop on their own. Um, yeah, this, this was death. And it was just like... These... You know, Bob, I gotta ask you a question. Go on. You can tell me your response. It almost feels like, I mean, this is WCW's booking. It almost feels like they're self-sabotaging their own guys. Like, you put these guys in there in a deathly spot with guys who aren't going to help get other guys over. Like, if Paige is going to go through all of this to win, like, it almost feels like there's, there's, they're like, well, we're going to let him win, but we're going to make sure he doesn't get over in the process. And, and it just like, it just, it, it feels like, I mean, when when you say something's WCW, at this point, it almost feels like uh, like there's kind of this almost schizophrenic booking logic where, well, we're gonna we're gonna let this guy win, but let's make sure that no one remembers it, no one liked it, and it doesn't really help him or us as a company. Yeah, let let's try and do the minimal amount we can do to fulfill our obligations for people who bought the pay per view. We said we're going to have a battle ball tournament. We're going to have a winner, but we've got nobody good in mind or no story to get anyone good in mind. So we're just going to do the minimum we can, and we're not going to do anything more. It, I, I I agree. I mean, the the whole thing with battle ball, we can talk about it now, I suppose. I mean, the. Jeff, the concept is horrendous. I mean, we've seen it before. We've seen it at Starcades before. I don't think it works particularly well. We've seen it as Battle Bolt as a show itself in 1993. It didn't work very well then. We've seen it as a part of, and that was a purely, that was, that was this show without any of the stuff in the middle. Um, and then we've seen it here as well. You, you need a, a roster that is four times as over as WCW you have now to be able to pull it off. And you need a story that is far better built. And they just don't have either of those things. And it's just awful. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> any feedback, yes. any response to that? Uh, I, you know what? I, I'll say this. I think you could do a tag team King of the Ring tournament. Cause that's this, that's basically what this is. It's the Lord of the Ring, right? I think with the with the roster they have, you could do a tag team King of the Ring, culminating in a battle in a Royal Rumble, which is basically what this is. It's King of the Ring plus Royal Rumble equals Schmoltz, right? Yeah. I think I think they have the roster. I think they had too many matches, too many guys, booked the wrong guys in the wrong spot. It's kind of like you know you understand that you're gonna bake a lasagna tonight, except you have no ingredients that or in the lasagna, and it's not going to taste like lasagna. So, I mean, it, it's just, it was a, com- a complete schmoz, a complete mess. I think there, I think there's something to taking successful gimmicks that work for other companies and massaging them into your own, but I think you have to do it with competence, and I don't think competence and WCW booking uh, kind of go hand in hand. It's not like the Louisiana State Athletic Commission is forcing them to do a Battle Bowl tag team competition. You can book whatever you like on a wrestling show. You, it's a blank slate every month. Jeff, you were on here before and you talked about the ledger, you know, the, the mythical WWF ledger. You've got a blank slate. You can do whatever you like. And I don't know whether there's this thought of it's a lazy way of getting through a show if we just book a tournament like this. It's not a lazy way. A lazy way will just be going, let's write down the 20 best guys we got on the roster that are available on this night and let's pair them off in seven matches. That's a lazy way of doing it. It would have been far better than this. And you're right. And I, I, we'll discuss the Dime Dallas page a bit more when we review the... Um, uh, the Nitro on the 27th in a bit, because uh, they did that a bit more. But yeah, the, the whole thing, not explaining the rules, not doing anything, well, whatever. Anyway, we're backstage with the Giant, Oakland and Jimmy Hart. Giant says Sting may have been up the mountain before, but he's not on top of the mountain tonight. He also has some choice words for Dallas Page. See, at this point, I thought maybe, maybe. They, they, they thought enough, at least, at least, because I, I tell you this, that, that there have been times, there would have been times before where they would have booked someone in that kind of match and they just wouldn't have acknowledged it. When they're gonna go, when they're gonna go back on what they're doing, they wouldn't have acknowledged it. They thought at least to have giant, ha- make comment about Paige. They at least thought that bit. Anyway. We move on to the main event. It's the Giant with Jimmy Hart versus Sting uh, uh, with Lex Luger for the WCW World Heavyweight title. Luger will be handcuffed to Jimmy Hart. And here's Michael Buffer. We start off at pace. Sting bounces off the ropes and throws himself at Giant with a crossbody. He just 
bounces off. Uh, Sting goes for a sleeper and the crowd wake up. Sting does his usual slaying the giant routine. The actual giant just stays on his feet. Giant hits a big, big boot that fires Sting across the ring. Hit, they lay that into his chest. Uh, Sting goes for a body slam but just falls under the giant's weight. Giant goes for a headbutt to the groin. Luger spent the entire match just dragging Hart around ringside. Giant has a leg waist lock on, um, on the match. He's using the ropes for leverage. On the match, on the floor, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Luger is trying to whip up the crowd while Hart desperately tries to win him back because they're obviously handcuffed together so Hart's uh, all of a sudden begging you off. We end up going up the R way. We end up by a completely arbitrary tra- table halfway up the R way. It actually has been there a few weeks and Flair has had some banquets at it but it was, it, it was there solely for the purpose of this spot and it was kind of jutting into where some fans would have otherwise been sitting. Giant sets up for a choke sound, choke sound sting through it but as he gets him up Luger has laid Hart across the table to prevent him doing that. That was really nice. Really nice. Throw back to the story on Monday. Giant intense running kick, uh, drop kick in the ring, which looked really impressive. Luger pulls Sting out of the way anyway. Sting then levels the ref. They're saying he thought he was the giant. Sting gets Giant laid across the top rope. He lays in some kicks as the crowd wake up. Giant grabs Luger by the throat on the apron. Sting te- keeps taking a free splash with his shots. Sting falls to Giant. He goes for a splash on Hart, who's laying across the top rope. Luger falls and pulls Hart off. Sting crashes into the unmarked turnbuckle, staggers back across the ring and headbutts Giant in the crotch. Sting goes for a splash off the top. Giant kicks him out and Sting up, ends up landing on the ref, who takes another bump. Sting goes to the top again. He hits the splash, but the ref's down. Sting tries to lock in the Scorpion Deathlock. He makes it. Luger and Hart fight over the megaphone on the apron. It ends up flying three and hitting Sting in the head. Giant goes for a choke slam. Sting gets some very nice air up there, and Giant wins the match. Jeff, um, I I enjoyed several components of this match, and I thought other points were just completely overbooked and goofy. Um, uh, to just to get the goofy part off my chest, I think Jimmy Hart is way too over the top for a world champion at this point. I think the Giant needs to be booked seriously, and I think that Hart, uh, it's hard to make the Giant feel legitimate with Jimmy Hart going around saying baby with the microphone and stuff, um, especially after the years in which, you know, Hart's value as a manager hasn't really been the tops. He's been associated with Hogan. He doesn't really contribute much. I mean, it just feels kind of gimmicky, and I think I think the Giant has a lot of upside. And I think this match, when you have a guy who's going to work with him, I mean, Sting isn't known as a as a world class, you know, uh, worker in the in the same sense as like an Arn Anderson or, or or whatnot. But he, you know, if you put the Giant in there with guys who are going to let him shine them up, and you know, he he's got the body, he's got the the obviously the size and. And, 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 you know, I think, I think there's a way to make him into your, your poster boy. I think, I think he's, I think there's a lot to the giant. Now going to the match, the stipulation of the handcuffs, I dug that. Um, I thought, I liked how they worked it into the match, that table spot where, where Jimmy Hart is kind of the, the protector for Sting, I, I thought was great. That said, I thought the commentators did a really poor job of teasing anything in the match. I mean, you have Luger who used to be in the Dungeon of Doom and who's, friend, who's the tag team partner of Sting, and they really don't sell what's at stake. Uh, they didn't sell that anything was really at stake outside of the title match. I mean, I thought I thought this is where, you know, winning the Battle Bowl would have let Luger have that extra incentive to involve himself and, and interject himself in this match. Because um, it seems like that's where they're going. Uh so naturally, you know, Luger. Well, that, just, that is where they're going. We, yeah. we 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 find that out by the end of the month, somewhat arbitrarily, admittedly. But yeah, that is the next step of the story. So, I mean, if if that's the direction you're going in, there's so much more of a story to tell. Um, I thought the first ref bump was interesting. I mean, it it it, it, it again, it's one of those things where it's like I want the giant who's a legitimate giant. I want him to be booked as as strong and as 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 hot as possible and. I mean, two rough bumps and the way the finish, I mean, if you're trying to get Sting out of there, I understand it. Um, you know, by this time, there were so many matches, it's so hard and, and it's exhausting for this live crowd to get into anything. So when you're, you know, doing the baby face shine and trying to get, you know, the fans to root for Sting and his selling and his comeback, it's it's just, you're, they're drained by this point. But even still, they had a really, this was, you know, a really good you know, big man versus the baby face match. Uh, this, I, I've never really understood the difference between the stinger splash in the corner and the stinger splash off the top. If those are both, you know, 
variants of a Stinger Splash or if there's a different name. I always find that confusing. Um, but yeah, as a whole, uh, I, I would have put the Giant over a little cleaner. I know that's weird because uh, Sting's been such a, a friend for the company, but I think I think the Giant's your investment for the future, and I think it would have been healthy to keep him stronger looking. I probably should have researched this before saying it, because this may not be true. But this might be Sting's first world title match on a pay-per-view that we've covered. Um, I'm just trying to think, because it, it was... First up, it was Vader in 93, but Vader was busy with Cactus Jack. He lost the title to Flair. Um, Flair... Because the whole thing with the NWA world title, which comes the international title, which I've got a feeling Sting held, if he didn't, he certainly wrestled for it at one point. Um, and then Hogan comes along, beats Flair, and they haven't done Hogan and Sting yet. So from mid-94 through to the end of 95, Sting didn't wrestle for the title. Now, he probably was in the 60-man uh, uh, World War Three title match, but I'll exclude that. Uh, he wrestled Flair and Luger in December for a shot at Savage, but he didn't win it. We may be three years into this show, this project, and this might be the first time we're watching Sting in a WCW title match on pay per view. I, th- I think you're, I think you're right because I think they they gave Sting the kind of the US title, and he was carrying that for most of '95. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, he, he never he hasn't fought Hogan yet, um, no. other than. The, uh, match they had on Nitro together, um, uh, which obviously tells you that it was about October time, but I think Hogan at that point wasn't champion anymore. Uh, and if it was, it certainly wasn't for the title. But yeah, in terms of on pay-per-view, because it was, it was Vader and Cactus Jack into Vader and Flair to begin with. Flair held the title. Sting did some stuff with the NWA world title, which obviously was called the world title, and they were calling it that even though it wasn't, and it was certainly a secondary title. And then he did wrestle a match for the e international title, and all that stuff happened in 94. But I've got a feeling this might be his first world title match, which is fascinating in, in its own way in, in our timeline. Also, he's, he, he's, he's won it before, so he's starting to wrestle for it, etc., etc. But... That being said, let's come back to some of the points you made. I, I am completely in agreement on Jimmy Hart. Um, I, I've watched him really, I've only really seen this run, WCW run. I haven't seen any of Jimmy Hart really, um, in his WWF days. And I thought Hart was a consistent negative when he was around Hulk Hogan and that it made no sense that Hogan needed Hart by his, by his side. Hart turned heel, which was just so obviously, you know, so predictable. Um, that, you know, I wasn't really shocked. I was just disappointed that it happened. Um, that all being said, Lex Luger is working so well right now. He's beginning to make me like Jimmy Hart just a little bit. I think Luger, Luger's work, and we'll discuss later on the show, Luger's work has been phenomenal recently. He's so good. And his, some of his stuff here was really good as well. I thought the bit where they cut the ringside and because they're handcuffed together, Hart is just trying to win Luger back desperately. I thought that was great. Um, this match was surprisingly decent. Um, surprisingly decent, or maybe not in the sense that we've seen Sting before, he's wrestled Big Bubba, he's wrestled the Shark, Sting is one of the best guys I've seen at wrestling a paint by numbers, but quite entertaining match against the bigger man, he's got his spot, he'll pick him up for the body slam, he can't make it, he gets splashed down, he plays the, well, doesn't play Babyface in peril, it's not a tag match, but he gets beaten down for a while, he's got the rally back spot with the splashes and trying to knock the big guy off his feet and all that stuff, he's got that down, Giant is still very very limited, but working with Sting, it just, it just about, well, Jeff, were you surprised by this match in terms of how good it was relative to where you thought it might be? Um, I think you kind of nailed, hit the nail on the head with the Sting works pretty decent with big men. Um, obviously, Giant is super green, or at least very, very uh, under-seasoned um, at this point. I mean, I, I think, I think the best I think you encapsulated my analysis of this match best when you said how good Luger was. I think the the best part about this match was kind of the stuff on the outside with Luger. And, I, I mean, for all the times I could have cared less about watching Lex Luger in a match, I think this might be as hot as he's gotten. And it's, you know, it's in a program where he's, you know, almost seconding, seconding, seconding Sting. Uh, you know, it's he's kind of... It's when they're not putting the focus on him that he's actually shining. So it's, uh, yeah, I wasn't surprised this match was good. 
uh, just because I, I mean, I think good is probably an overstatement. I think, uh, I think there could have been war. I think this is better than any match Hogan's had with the Giant. So, uh, oh yeah, by a long way. So, so, so I mean, you know, there you go. I mean, Sting's, Sting's a younger athletic, uh, baby face who did his job and for what they're paying him, he should have. So <laughs> I can't, I don't want to heap too much praise on him there. No, no, I, I think all, there's all, almost something to be said for all the rest of the show was so bad, this stood out in terms of it was an average match, but on a really poor show, it really stood out more than it perhaps should have done. Anyway, that will wrap up our review of this show. Jeff, you'd like to give us your final thoughts on this show and a score rating out of 10. <laughs> well, uh, it's nice to see all those guys getting pay-per-view uh, paydays. Um, I, I think they could have winnowed it down and had a halfway decent tournament and battle royal, whatever. Um Malenko had a good cruiserweight match. Nice seeing Liger. Um, I really loved all the flair and, and savage stuff. Would have loved to see more. Um, altogether, I'd say being generous, D+. Plus. What, what, I, what does that score out of 10? What's that score out of 10? I apologize. Great, grades, ratings. I should know I was a TA forever. Uh, uh, let's say a five and a half. Five and a half? Out of 10. You sure? Uh, well, I mean, it's, I'm going to pass it just because I liked uh, I liked the Malenko match and I liked the U.S. title match and uh, I liked the Flair stuff. I mean, let's put it like this: if I if I'm going to pass the time, I think I think Flair's stuff alone was worth the price of admission. Well, I I, I gave this show two out of ten, so there we go. Yeah, let's let's say there were positives on this show. But they all were TV angles, pretty much. The Flair Savage stuff was all a pretty good TV angle on a $30 pay-per-view. Uh, the main event would have been a very good Nitro main event, but it was a Nitro main event. It was two named guys in a good match. And obviously it got a bit longer, but Nitro's two hours now, so we're going to probably get used to a bit more of that. And then it ended in a nefarious finish. Other than that, like, I, I cannot share your praise for Malenko and Armstrong in that, to an extent, you can accept the crowd being quiet. One in the sense that they had a shit show to begin with, and two in the sense that Malenko and Brad Armstrong aren't guys they've been exposed to. But if a match is in any way decent, they will get the crowd into it, and they didn't. I don't think they did at any stage. Cohen Allen Liger, yes, was another good match in front of a flat crowd. Um, this, th- that score rating says more for WCW than it does for the guys they put out there. Um, but I can't give this any more than a two. There was some good stuff. The flair angle with McMichael and Green is really good, but it's a TV angle. That's, that's it. This was, this was a, a really good one hour nitro with two hours of just shit pumped into it. That was what this was. And, and I can't give it any more than that. No, I can absolutely. I, I completely. I, I, I can see where you're coming from. I think I'm a little more lenient, uh, just because that's. I'm just grading leniently. I think I, I can completely justify a two out of ten. You, you haven't seen enough of this timeline that I've seen in this. <laughs> you, you you haven't been on enough shows talking about this enough. It's like we get people doing ECW stuff, and they're like, "Yeah, great show, nine out of 10 I'm thinking. You sure? But I will forgive people that. I will give. I will give you five and a half. You're entitled to your. Uh-huh. Own opinion. I wouldn't say it was consistent with your review of the show. It was kind of my my surprise. Okay. Okay, Bob. There's never been a nine out of ten ECW show. We both know that. So. <laughs> <laughs> November to remember last year was decent. To oh, yeah? be fair. To be oh, yeah. fair. But I, I am aware of your disdain. <laughs> for the stuff coming out of Philadelphia, I will I will say no more. <laughs> Thank you. Nitro on May the 20th, the night after Slambury, is a 90-minute show. There's no McMichael on commentary. He's training, I think. We open up with the Steiner Brothers versus Fire and Ice. There's a very physical few minutes between Rick and Norton, including a lovely released German suplex. The action spills to the outside. Norton hits a modified shoulder breaker on Scott Steiner, but the referee calls for the bell. Rick and Ice train have a brawl up the aisle way and to the back. Next up is Eddie Guerrero against Ric Flair. Rick scarpers after a period of Guerrero offense and the grabs a chair from the banquet table, inexplicably still on the R way. The referee Reed buffs this and shoves Flair. Flair shoves him back. Bobby Heenan is surprised at the 50-50 nature of this match. Eddie goes to lock in a figure four, but Flair is able to get to the ropes. 
to quote Bobby Heenan well he's done it 13 times 15 if you count those two Bischoff we're not counting those those aren't wrestling championships Guerrero hits a swinging DDT from the top and a big splash but both times selling a knee cost him the instant cover the second time Flair follows it with a figure four and Guerrero ends up getting pinned with Flair holding on to him for some extra leverage decent match this Oakland interviews Flair after the match he says he heard Savage in the building heard Savage is in the building Flair does his usual stick comments on Kevin Green before grabbing some champagne for a celebration and joins Heenan and Bischoff on commentary for a banquet for the rest of the show Next up is the Faces of Fear, Meng and Barbarian against the tag champs of Luger and Sting. Sting takes a double top rope splash from Meng and Barbarian. Sting hits a splash off of the chop and Luger makes the pin. We cut to the outside of Randy Savage who hasn't been left in the building. Savage claims Oakland is trying to set him up. He makes an attempt to get back in but is held back by half a dozen police. Next up is Darren Dallas Page versus Brad Armstrong. They're saying Page's win yesterday is being investigated, which is tech speak for there's no way Darren Dallas Page is main eventing a WCW pay-per-view. Page wins with the diamond cutter. He concludes with the match by giving himself a high five. We then get an in-ring promo from him, which is a nice surprise. I've got one thousand to thank my self. Self high five. Page does call out the giant. Maybe my pessimism was misplaced. Oakland cuts the steals from last night, including Page's foot touching the floor during the Battle Royal. They're not granting Page the championship shot. They're instead awarding it to Lex Luger, which makes no sense at all. The main event is Arnson against the Giant for the world title. Arn comes out with the Taskmaster, who says he's only here to ensure that he has a fair chance. Giant wins clean with a choke slam, and Flair scarpers from the country position after the match. And we will now return live to the show to review the 27th edition of Nitro. It's very impressive here tonight, and of course it's Lamberry. Hey, snap her head! Zip it! Last night, Diamond Dallas Page, bang! Shocked the world! Good! God, in the lethal lottery contest, the best of the best, Flair, Macho, Luger, Steiners, Road Warriors, Sullivan, Double A, Fire and Ice, Barbarian, Ming, need I go on? But when it was all said and done, there could only be one, yeah, and that was DDP, standing in the middle with the ring, the new Lord of the Rings, and I got one person to thank my self self high five all right shut up you Di- jerk. diamond dallas which brings me to my next agenda the g-man wow wait a minute the seven footer giant boy you're mine you're wearing something oh, that's give mine me a on, just come a on, second Paige. i want you to listen to what i have to say uh-oh diamond please come over here what i just got off the telephone I just got off the telephone with the championship committee of WCW. They have informed me. They have viewed the videotape footage. I want you to take a look now to our national television audience because, yes, there's the diamond cutter. We're taking a look at that. And then Diamond Dallas Page, the executive committee, the championship committee, noticed that you got the pin with your foot on the floor. Now, now here, here's the story. Here's what? the story, my friend. They cannot take the Lord of the Ring away from you. The they will not reverse the decision of the referee. What However, that was your foot. I went over, skipped my foot off, right on the apron. That is footage. That is foul footage. That boom. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. They will not grant you the championship shot what? at the Giant at the Great American Bank. Are you kidding me? Hey, keep your hands Are you off kidding me. me. I'll walk out of here if you ever touch me again. They have awarded the shot. To Lex Luger, ladies and gentlemen, he will be. Take care of this. Wow! I never want that man to put his hands on me. Get me a, get me an officer up here. And we come back in from the TV review. We are on to May the twenty seventh. The first four two hour night. The one on the twentieth was ninety minutes. I can't particularly 
I don't think they've worked out why. But yeah, they did basically three weeks at seven o'clock at one hour, uh, while NBA did the playoffs. Something happened on the 20th that gave them an extra half hour. I presume that may have been NBA related too. And then on May 27th, they formally moved into the eight o'clock start for a two hour nitro. This is going to be the same going forward. So I think we'll, we're going to discuss. There's obviously one big storyline coming out of this show that we'll discuss, but we'll discuss some of the other things. I've also got some other things to discuss with Jeff coming off, but I will read you through my TV notes and we will come to, um, our comments as we get to them. May the 27th, see the first two-hour Nitro. They're splitting the commentary team in half. Larry Zabisco and Tony Schiavone will call the first half hour, uh, first hour of the show, and Bischoff and Heenan will call the second. We open up with Ric Flair and Arn Anson versus the American Males. The males dominate most of the early going, clearing the ring before leaving the crowd and clapping along for their theme song. The crowd are quiet but liven up as Flair and the ref get into a shouting match. We end the match with a series of counter pins with the ref distracted. Woman gouges Bagwell's eyes. Arn DDTs him and Flair calls over for the pin Aronson says we don't respect anybody that has to wear protective gear Flair says while you've been playing football I've been making my way down Austin way Deborah belongs to Flair we then get a video package of Michael and Green down the gym Jeff uh, very quickly on, on all of this stuff and all the stuff with Flair and Anderson it's still very good isn't it I love it. I, I really don't think Arn and, and Flair can have a bad tag match together. I mean, if, if you want to go back through the canon and look at their, their, you know, little mini feuds with the Midnight Express and with the Hollywood Blondes, I mean, that ranks up there with some of the best cold programs of the last decade, in my opinion. I mean, I mean, Arn and Flair, I mean, they're just, they're just so good at what they do. And I mean, I'm, hey, I'm not a Ric Flair fan. Um, but this stuff is thoroughly entertaining. And maybe it's because, uh, you know, the other things that surround it aren't, but I, I'm really loving this. And the stuff with Flair talking about taking a man's wife, I mean, you want to get heat. I mean, oof, I, that's, that's heat. <laughs> Next up is Steve Doll versus the Mauler. Your guess is as good as mine. I can at least tell you that Steve Dahl is actually Stephen Dunn from the uh, the well-travelled tag team of Well Done from WWF in late 94 and 95. Mauler is being managed by Conor Robert Parker. He hits a nice second rope fall away slam. We return from the break and it's Razor Ramon. What are you talking about? Look, look here. Oh, oh, what the hell? Wait, we need security I have no idea. Hey. Wait a minute. I can't believe it. I can't believe what I'm saying. It's you people. What's with him? You know who I am. But you don't know why I'm here. Are we going to get security here? Where is billionaire Ted? Okay. Where is the nacho man. That punk can't even get in the building. Me, I go wherever I want, whenever I want. And where, oh where, is Scheme Gene? Because I got a scoop for you. When that Ken doll look-alike, when that weatherman wannabe comes out here later tonight, I got a challenge for him, for billionaire Ted, for the nacho man, and for anybody else in uh, WCW. <laughs> hey, you want to go to war? You want a war? You're going to get one. Fantastic. What about the match? It's not actually Razor Ramon. Obviously, it's, it's, you know, they didn't mention him by name, but you know, I think he will be called Scott Hall but until they formalise that. I'm calling him Ramon, at least for now. He, he says... We could call him Denim Dan. 
Yeah, double denim. That was a brave shout. I don't know about, don't know about that. Anyway, he says, you people, you know who I am, but you don't know why I'm here. Where's billionaire Ted? Where is the Nacho man? The punk can't even get in the building. I go wherever I want, whenever I want. And where, where is Scheme Gene? Because I've got a scoop for you. You want a war, you're gonna get one. Razor walks to the back and the match, I think, ends in a no contest. Jeff, talk us through this. Um, this was really exciting. This is one of those things where it's like, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, can't believe my eyes for a second there because he just, you know, he's coming off of the other program, the other TV, and he's just, I think it was very inventive to have him jump the rail, um, and, and to have him not just do like a, a manufactured beatdown of two job guys, you know, Mike Enos is the mauler, I believe. Um, you know, he just shows up and is like, hey guys, I'm here to talk. Obviously, they'll tap dance around the invasion stuff as long as they can. It's, it's, it's clever, great stuff. Um, I, I, I really, I, I found myself riveted by this. I wasn't so happy or I shouldn't say, wasn't so impressed with his promo delivery here. Uh, I thought it could have been a little better. I mean, he's taking stuff directly from Scarface still. Um, but it, it was, it was, it was riveting. Yeah, I wonder whether there was a trade-off between him wanting to deliver a killer promo and him wanting to deliver a promo in a way that made people think he was still Razor Ramon. And I, they they got that balance just about right, but I agree, given the, the nature of the promo, him really scar-facing it up, it, it took the edge off it, but I think that was the idea, was you're meant to think it's still Razor Ramon. Um, even though obviously there's certain things they can't do in WWF's legal team I think are probably going to be all over this but as as I think Dave Meltzer said in The Observer once you strip it down to the stuff he was doing as Diamond Stud after that are we just going to court over the accent like is that it at which point I don't think that's particularly going to hold up well, then, then Brian De Palma and Oliver Stone should sue for the Scarface yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, th- do that too yeah Build, build up a class action. Maybe do that. Um, but no, like, uh, very effective. They've done it with Luger before. So Luger didn't cut a promo out the gate. He just walked out. But I like the, it's the, it's the Alundra Blaze thing or the Medusa thing from December. It's just occasionally, every now and then, and okay, all these things to an extent are falling into their lap. They're not stacking these things up. But just occasionally it's like, we got a surprise. Let's deliver it as a surprise just because just occasionally, and let's be honest, Steve Steve Dole versus the Mauler is not a match we're ever going to see on Nitro again. The idea was, but two guys out there, and, and that was clearly the reason why the match just ended. But that was the point. And so far, and we're going to discuss as we get through this report, so far, so good. Next up is Dime Dallas Page versus Craig Pittman. Page mocks Pittman with some press-ups. Pittman responds by doing some one-armed press-ups. Or push-ups, I suppose you'd call it, your side of the United Jeff. Uh, Pittman shoots for the code red armbar. Page goes to the ropes by grabbing onto, uh, Teddy Long and shoving into the guardrail. He then hits the diamond cutter for the win. We get a promo from the shark who's pissed off at Jimmy Hart and the Dungeon of Doom for throwing him out. That did happen. We get a highly self-indulgent promo looking at Hulk Hogan's interaction with some of the celebrities over the last couple of years. We come back for hour number two with Bischoff and Heenan. Bischoff says that they're not even going to dignify the interruption with a response. Shark is literally getting a world title. Yeah, the shark is getting a world title shot. Oh, you know, he co main evented SummerSlam 1990, so what are you going to do? The, the, the next logical step, I guess. Yeah. I guess. Um, shark tries to get Jarn off his feet. Jarn picks him up for a body slam, rotates around and drops him down. Bischoff says, I'll eat this desk if Jarn can pick up Shark and slam him. And the, uh, the desk remained intact. Uh, Giant ends the match with a choke slam after Hart distracts Shark. Out comes the new Big Bubba who ends up shaving Shark's hair off. Uh, Jeff, any comments on this angle? I know you mentioned it earlier. Oh, no, I'm just happy it's over. Oh, okay. <laughs> probably, probably the best comment you could have made. Uh, next up is Lex Luger against Max. You remember his Max Muscle? I mentioned that earlier. Max hits a slam but forgets to pin Luger. That looks a bit ugly. He kind of slammed him, started to cover him, got up, waited a second or two, and then pin covered him again. It looked a bit weird. We then hear Eric Bischoff away from his mic. That Luger's in. He came back. He just wasted a little uh, too much time, and there could be a three-pointer. No, no. He wants to come out here. He can wait to the end of the hour. Eric. He can wait till the end of the hour. Get him the heck out of here. 
Get him the heck out. Oh. All right, back with you. Apologize for the interruption. He says if he wants to come out here, he can come out here at the end of the hour. That sounded quite good, actually. Uh, Luger gets Max in the torture rack, and the crowd makes some big noise. Biggest of the night. Max admits we get a post-match promo from Luger. They replay Luger getting choked slammed through the table. Um, let's talk about Luger now, Jeff, uh, while we're on the subject. Um, I, I, I am, having watched Luger be probably overpushed by WWF as this very prototypical Vince McMahon babyface, having watched Vince McMahon give up on him and then watch Lex Luger in the doldrums for the next year and be kind of quite bored and quite astonished that they ever pushed him in the first place. It's taken about seven or eight months in WCW, but I am all in on Lex Luger now. I think he's so good right now. I'd actually argue he's one of their best acts full stop. I would totally agree with you. I think he, I think there's a little bit more edge to him now. I think the fact was when he debuted, you know, coming out of Florida in the mid to late eighties, he was, he had a million dollar look, but he was still really raw. And I think now, I mean, I don't know what Titan really did for him. I think it did a lot against him. It was obviously, you know, the push didn't get what he wanted from WWF. Um, but now I think he's got a lot more seasoning. Um, his character's a lot more, you know, fleshed out. He's got a lot more personality. And I, I, I mean, if you put him up next to Sting, I mean, he's the fresher character. And I think, uh, I think it's all kind of starting to click for him. I, I hope it pays off. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know if he's got the ability politically to, uh, be their number one baby face, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with you here. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to his babyface prospects at the end when we, we kind of get to that bit. But he is, he's just so entertaining right now. Part of it, I think, is just that because he's playing this kind of half babyface, half heel, he can just roll with whatever reaction he gets. And so when he goes into towns where he's a bit more heelish, he can just heal it up. And when he comes into towns where he's a babyface, he can just act like a babyface. The torture rack is the most over move in WCW right now. Yep. Um, Luca, he didn't even get him up. He went to get Max Muscle up and the crowd popped. And there was the bit, I think, at Starcade where, where he wrestled at Starcade and he put in the torture rack. The pace exploded. And it's like they've got something right with Luger here. And it's like he's motivated. And for Luger more than most, that makes so much of a distant difference. Anyway, next up is hard work Bobby Walker versus Brad Armstrong. Bischoff doesn't want to, quote, incur the wrath of any legal teams hanging around like vultures. Walker fucks up twice in succession, just about catching himself before he falls off the turnbuckle to the outside. He does win the match with a move off the top rope. Next up is Alex Wright versus Lord Stephen Regal. The Brad Brown's cold vignettes are for a character called Glacier, coming soon to WCW. This is quite a nice match, actually. Rigel, uh, Wright, Rigel? Wright and Regal mesh well together. Regal says something into the camera while working a chin lock, and there are youngsters that want to take this away from him. No bloody chance. Wright falls on the back of his head, coming off the first turnbuckle, and Regal ties him up for the pin. Thank you, Eric. Uh, with me, Lord Stephen Regal. Most impressive, I must say, against this youngster, just barely 20 years old. But uh, the one thing that the fans bring out to me as I travel around the country, Lord Stephen Regal, is the way you feel about Americans. Uh, apparently, uh, you, you have some adverse feelings toward us. Listen to me, you miserable little toad. You telling me how to act my life is like Quasimodo telling somebody how to bloody walk straight. Let me point out... Now I have your attention. It's Memorial Day. My father will be so pleased I beat Junior Adolf there. We have got a world champion here in WCW that's a bloody escapee from Barnum and Bailey's. We've got bloody Savage running around thinking he's some kind of hard man. If you didn't notice, two weeks ago, I put the toughest man in wrestling out of the bloody game. Then... We've got somebody from another wrestling organization wanting to take on war. Don't forget who's in within Sunshine because I'm going nowhere and it's time I had my bloody say in what goes on around here. You know, I should point out just for the record, uh, the affection that these fans have for you, I couldn't help but notice the one youngster here giving you half a peace sign. I don't think they think that highly of your personality, your wrestling skills notwithstanding. When you are a significant grappler as myself, 
You are not bothered by such meager peasants. And that means you, sunshine. Now, to prove myself, I am going to make a statement, a challenge if you wish, to the man they call the franchise. If I beat this man and you, Mr. Sting, I hope you're listening, I will then be held within some esteem here well. and maybe get a shot at this bloody circus freak that we have as a champion. I want that painted face bloody clown. Please. Right in this Thank you very much. Possible. I, take it to the championship committee, please. I can't stand the heat. Eric, let's get back to you. In a post-match promo where Oakland asks Regal about his dislike of Americans, he ends up calling him, quote, Junior Adolf. Okay. Really good promo from Regal. This Regal ends up calling out Sting, Savage, Giant and Ramon. Uh, Jeff, we'll talk about the, the longer term prospects of a two hour Nitro at the end. But one thing I will say about two hour Nitro, it's giving us more opportunities. We had a Diamond Dallas Page promo, I think it was last week, which admittedly was on the 90 minute show. But they've got more time, so matches are going to get a bit more time, but they're also going to give a bit more time to these middle of the card characters. And we talk about their, you know, we talk about Battle Bowl, we talk about Slambury and then not having over undercard guys if they've got more time to cut promos in front of millions of people they're going to get over and Regal for all the talk of Scott Hall's promos on these shows this was probably the best promo of the night I thought yeah no I I, I think I think Regal as a character is is tremendous I think I think I think the Razor character is kind of hamstrung by as we said like kind of trying to really draw the associations from that identifiable brand character and doing the accent kind of kind of stilted his promo. Um I think I think Regal, I think the best stuff about Regal is like, I mean, the facial expressions and just the way he has I mean he he conveys such disregard and disgust. It's it's great. I mean it's I think I think when they go to two hours, they've got they've got the money and they've got the the undercard there. It's just a matter of putting the the, the pieces into place where they can do something with it. Now I mean, they've got, I, I think, I think what's most important with two hours is you don't want to dilute your talent for the pay-per-view. So what I, and what, by saying that, I think if you look at Regal should be working towards feuding with, say, Sting. I think that up until that point, you could have some really great back and forths between the two. Um, and then, you know, build to a payoff. I think, I think more guys will benefit from this. Hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I think they've got, mate, they've probably almost just about got enough talent where they could fill a really good two hour show every week. Perhaps they need to move a few more pieces around, get rid of a couple of the more older statesmen and look at guys like Rey Mysterio and Psychosis that we've seen on ECW. Or we, I've seen, I don't know how much ECW you're watching, Jeff, but those kind of guys that are really entertaining, that are available, that can help pad out this show, but, from a perspective that if this was an hour-long show, this match may not have happened anyway. And if it had, it would have just cut to an ad or we would have come back and then we would have featured one of the main guys. They're not going to be able to get double the amount of action out of Sting, Hogan, Giant, Luger on a two-hour show because they will run them into the ground. They will hideously overexpose them. So you extend the length of the show. You've got to fill stuff in there with younger under what, undercard talent. Not necessarily will be young. That really can only be positive, I think. Um, and you know, Regal's come out here. We've heard Regal cut promos before, and he's been quite good. Um, but this was excellent. I mean, you know, not not the most difficult thing to play the anti-American thing, but delivery was good. Called out all the right names. Big two thumbs up for me. And it's the main event time. It's Sting versus Scott Steiner. It's probably worth, out, worth seeking out this match just for Scott's ponytail. This is a hard-heating match. Bischoff pushes, pushes the match for its lack of outside interference. And literally five seconds later, out walks Lex Luger. Rick Steiner follows soon after. Sting hits a tombstone pile driver, but doesn't quite manage it. Scott goes for a suplex on Sting on the outside. Luger kicks him. Rick goes out to him. The match ends up being thrown out after all four men brawl. We end the show with Bischoff and Heenan in commentary position they get interrupted by Ramon they both want to be on top here at WCW and the only way to do that is you gotta kick people's butts you gotta make enemies all right all right all right hey looky here you wanted to say doll, you got such a big mouth and we we are sick of it what do you mean who's we you know who hey this 
is where the big boys play? What a joke. I tell you what. You go tell billionaire Ted, you tell him, get three of his very, very best. Maybe, uh, maybe the nacho man. Oh, no. Hey, maybe, maybe you get the stinger. Ooh, I'm so scared. You go get anybody you want because we. What do you mean we? We are taking over. You want to go to war? You want a war? You got one. Only, only let's do it right. In the ring where it matters. Not on no microphones. Not in no newspapers or dirt sheets. Let's do it in the ring where it matters. If, uh, if billionaire Ted and his big boys, if they got any, uh, any guts, because we are coming down here. You're stepping over the line. And like it or not. Not. We are taking over. You're out of here. You're out of here. You've got such a big mouth, and we are sick of it. Who's we? Ask Bischoff. Tell billionaire Ted to get three of his very best. You go get anybody you want, because we are taking over. No, not on the micro, not on no microphones, not in the newspapers or the dirt sheets. Let's do it in the ring, where it matters. Like it or not, we are taking over. Um. Jeff, what do you think of this promo? Um, I, I think it's I think it's the foundation to building to something else, something you know, obviously going to get you know uh, bigger and bigger as the weeks progress, and they kind of stoke the flames of the invasion stuff. Um, I think one of the names I was reading in uh, the Observer was Davy Boy Smith, uh, possibly having his contract come up, which would be really interesting. Uh, you know, I, I think. I think the infusion of Scott, Scott Hall, Razor Ramon, whatever you, he's going to be called, um, I think it can, it can really only do good. I think he's really one of the best overall steals they could have got from WWF when you consider they couldn't call The Undertaker The Undertaker. Um, but Scott Hall definitely has the size or a similar size. And well, well, it's not that they couldn't call The Undertaker The Undertaker. They couldn't give The Undertaker The Undertaker gimmick. And in which case, what are you getting? You're, you're getting, getting a guy called, you're getting, you're getting mean Mark Callis. You know what I mean? Like. The intellectual property being what it is, I think, I think what, what's, what, uh, Meltzer wrote about, you know, between the Diamond Stud and, and the Razor Ramon character, they're so similar to begin with. I mean, I, I, I think, I think with what you, with what you're getting with, with Razor here, you're getting kind of the best of both worlds. You're getting the size, you're getting a big guy. Um, you know, who like Undertaker or Nash has that size that could go against a Hogan. Um, but you know, you've got a working ability. I mean, he's not Brett or Sean, but he's got the size there that, you know, guys like Hogan would have to sell for where it would be a struggle for the, you know, the smaller guys. I think outside of, of the champ jumping, like of Shawn Michaels jumping or maybe Brett, cause he has, you know, a little more tenure and a little more, uh, you know, credibility. I think, I think Razor, his work, his promo, his looks, he might be their, the best steal for WCW. He can work babyface or heel. I mean, he wasn't a consistent main eventer for Vince, but his face was all over their TV for years. He was booked prominently. He held their secondary title. He was always booked strong. I think this is a, this is a, a huge win. I, I, I think you touched on the point. It wasn't that he wasn't a consistent main eventer. He was almost never a main eventer. You know, uh, we missed the first seven or eight months of his run, which was probably his time nearest the top. Um, he had the two ladder matches against Sean, but neither of those main evented the shows they were on. And, and one of my biggest frustrations, we talk about WWF in 1995, was that Razor wasn't more prominently featured. Um, and yeah, like I, you know, I, 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 I'll touch that point in a second. I mean, I guess my, my question in the intervening minutes would be what do you think explicitly of the promo and what do you think of 
the way they handled it since the initial promo, because I really like the opening promo, and I like bits about what they did since, but I don't think it was a home run from the moment after Razor walked off the first time. No, I, I mean, honestly, the, the one thing that kind of caught me was he jumped the rail to begin with, but then he walked to the back. I don't know if you caught that. That's a good point. And, and you know, if you want to, you know, uh, kind of boast about, you know, blurring the lines of reality, I mean, he did come back. It was obviously... Well, well, you know, and more the point that he jumped the rail, you know, you're presenting him as this invading guy. Why wasn't security out there throwing him out? Well, I can I can answer that. It was, it was Doug Dillinger. Ah, okay. So it begins. So I mean, it... not, not the most reputable of security guards if, <laughs> if we've seen the pull aparts. That's true. That would have been the American males and you would have just ruined it right out the gate. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think the, the issue I have is like, you know, they get, the moment you start to give him a mic, you're, you're basically saying he's one of us. So I mean, I, I think I think the key to this entire angle and storyline and feud or whatever it's going to be is 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 kind of the old Hitchcock analogy of you know the biggest scare uh, is the one that you don't see and you leave it up to the fans' imagination and I think when you look here the more vague Razor is about what's happening the more the fans can go well what is this is Vince sending guys down. You know, and, and maybe, you know, they start reading dirt sheets and seeing, I don't like the name dirt sheet. I mean, they wouldn't call the Hollywood Reporter a dirt sheet, so why would they call it the Observer? But, you know, you, you could read the Observer and see, okay, whose contract is coming up? Cause, you know, anybody can show up at any time, maybe, and, you know, this kind of, that kind of shock factor really can, can resonate with fans. And again, a lot of that WCW roster is stale. And you talk about like the elder statesmen. I mean, you know, WWF has booked the next generation or the new generation or whatever they want to call it based on work rate and guys who can work. And, you know, while, while Scott Hall, Razor Ramon isn't Bret Hart or Shawn Michaels, he's, he's a lot better than the guys they have working on top. A lot of times when you look at the dungeon of doom, um, so yeah, I, I think I think the more mystique and, and mysterious kind of tone that they do of uh, of being vague, I think it goes farther. You know, I don't think I'd have done the promo at the end of the show. You know, like I I, I don't know, but I to me it felt like they were doing really really well with the initial promo. Got the got the bit over the top. Got the bit about calling out the guys he wanted to call out. I like the bit where Bischoff said when he joined commentary, we're not going to dignify it with a response. I even like the bit where he, he kind of half off mic, he said, if he wants to come out, come out at the end. I liked all that. But it kind of felt like Bischoff mentioned it a couple too many times. Did, w- would you agree with that? No, yeah, I agree. I think, I think if you want it to feel real, almost do that thing like when the fan, like, do you remember when Pillman grabbed Bobby Heenan? Yeah. Okay. And, and it was, it was about, about five months ago. I hope I would. And it was, it was an instant, <laughs> it was an instant reaction. It was impromptu. Heenan didn't see it coming and he reacted. And, you know, it's just like when a fan jumps the rail and the camera turns away because, you know, the ref has to take the guy down or, or Savage is just taking shots at the guy. Would it have been better if like Bischoff had just joined commentary and steadfastly refused to mention it and Heenan had just been like chipping away trying to get him to talk about it? Would that have been a better way of presenting it? I, Part of me thinks so, but then it's like if you have this big movie and Bruce Willis is in it and, you know, you want to sell the movie, you should probably mention that Bruce Willis is in the movie. You shouldn't, you know, just because it might spoil the surprise or might, you know, kind of detract from the 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 kind of tone of what you're aiming for. I think the larger, you know, intent obviously here is ratings and buy rates. So I, I, can, I think that booking wise, there's a smarter, more deliberate way to go about this. But if you want to get, you know, someone talking, I think you kind of have to shove it down their throats a bit. Um, just I, because... I think you've always got another week of TV, though, haven't you? You know, like, wouldn't wouldn't people be talking, like, Razor Ramones on Nitro? Oh, shit, I missed that. I need to tune to Nitro next week to find out the follow-up. Like, and, and the, the end promo, I, I, I just feel like, for me, there were two positives. One was the remote promo at the front, which I think was, other than, you're right, walking to the back and the lack of security was a problem. But other than that, it, it was it was fine. It was well presented. It was in the middle of a nothing match. He walked out, cut a promo, nice and succinct, fine. I like Bischoff on commentary, kind of half off air, you know, saying what he said. 
I think it would have been all right if they hadn't have done any more. There's always next week. There's always next week. And it's kind of like it was a bit too obvious. For me, I, you know, I, overall, it's sort of big positive. It's a great angle. I just feel like it could have been a bit more. Um, to to move back into a point you were half making before I drew it back into the, the end of the show itself. The future of this storyline, as we understand it, Kevin Nash, you know, aka Diesel will be coming in at some point in the next few weeks. Mid June is what I've heard. Um, that would that would tie in with around three months since he he handed in his notice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, they are talking about doing uh, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, if they are going to be named as well, God, God forbid they call him Oz, um, but Diesel, <laughs> Razor Ramon, and Lex Luger versus. Uh, Sting, Randy Savage, and either Ric Flair or the Giant. Um, uh, Jeff, I, you know, like, I, I like the, uh, if it's gonna be an invasion, it's gonna be Team WWF, not in name, but otherwise against Team WCW. Mike, you know, isn't Randy Savage more synonymous with WWF than Lex Luger? You know, I, I, I think you run, well, first of all, I think you run the problem with turning Luger for the 90,000th time. That is one. Uh, because I mean, but particularly while he's so over as a face. I, I think I think what would be interesting is I think the X factor here is the giant. Because when I look at the roster they have, I think he's got major baby face potential as like a big ass kicking. You know, I mean, I think I think he I think he I think he could be the pro wrestling Shaquille O'Neal. I think he has that, just that giant size, and he does have athleticism, as you can see, you know, with him uncorking the drop kick. I mean, he shouldn't even have to be doing that at his size. But I think when you have, if you have Team WWF or the Titans or whatever they're going to be called, I think when you have somebody coming over from, you know, the other, I mean, the WCW home team is obviously going to be Flair, Sting. Uh, they're the two, I mean, things called the franchise. Yeah, I mean, Savage is obviously more synonymous with with the WWF, but I I would think you know I I wouldn't want to turn I wouldn't want to turn Luger right now because I think you've got something hot there. But I think I think the main focal point should be as a babyface, focus on the Giant being your number one guy. Hogan's not going to be around forever. Sting has been kind of diluted. Honestly, I would rather see them turn Sting and almost do something and say, you know what. We went to WCW and we didn't do it. They didn't do anything with us. You know, Diesel and Razor were made by Vince McMahon. Sting, come with us. The sky is the limit. And Sting has never turned. And I think that would almost be cooler because, you know, I think Sting is one of the staler characters on the show. And I, I don't know. I think, I think there, I think there are many better options than Luger. I think Luger's probably the worst option. Um, you know, and the one thing we have mentioned, oh, where does Hulk Hogan fit into all this? Like, you know, the, the idea seems to be that they're going to have, t- quote unquote, Team WWF, not in name, you know, Diesel, Razor and Luger go over WCW team. And then Hulk Hogan returns August, September and saves the day and fights off the, the, the three WWF guys. Hulk Hogan is, is more WWF than any of those guys, and particularly when he left us last month as a character that isn't particularly over, you you almost run the problem of, you know, you try and put Hogan against Scott Hall, and you end up with a situation where, I don't like Hogan, Scott Hall's a bit fresher, he's younger, he's cooler, he's better looking, he's everything Hogan is it in 1996. Hogan coming into this mess is really odd. Yeah, I mean, I think I think Hogan's shrewd enough in a business sense. I think if you look at, I mean, one of the reasons, you know, if you look at why they had the two Razor Ramon promos instead of the one, I think the moment Hogan shows up, I mean, he runs rough shot over creative. He can call his shots. So maybe they're looking at, we have to get as much in as we can while we can before he comes back. Because once he comes back, it's the Hulk Hogan show, right? Yeah. And if yeah. you look at, you know, I mean, when, you know, the young guys, Luger's not a young guy, but guys who maybe should be hotter than they presently are, I think sometimes you can kind of see, okay, well, this guy's an up-and-coming gay face. Well, you're only going to get yay far because that's Hogan's spot. And while Hogan doesn't have the success as a babyface in certain parts of the WCW territory that he did with WWF and Vince McMahon, and obviously, I mean, he's 
markedly skinnier, one might say. Um, and he's, his character's obviously been diluted over the years, but I, I think, I think the, the main concern is Hogan's gonna come back and he's gonna position himself to win all the matches. So as long as he's getting paid, I don't think, I, I think it's, I think it's a, it's about Bischoff finding a way to work everybody around Hulk Hogan because it's it's his world. They just live in it. I've just got visions of the Bash at the Beach show in July. The you know Team WWF win the day. You know presumably Nash pins uh, who be in that match. Nash pins Sting. That's probably the most likely well, outcome of that it's, match. It's Flair. Flair's taking the fall. Oh yeah, I suppose that's true. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, Nash pins Flair. Team WWF stand tall, and then Hulk Hogan comes out and just cleans house. And that's the end of the show. And then we get three months of quite interesting, quite well drawn, but ultimately quite disappointing programs between Hogan and the two new guys. It ends up with Hogan on top, back as champion. This storyline, this storyline is going to be better without Hogan in it. I think. I think I mean, if you look at, I think if you look at the Vader matches, because Vader should have had his win. Yes. Then you can come back. And Flint, I mean, to be fair, Flair should have had his win. So I, I, I think when you look at the kind of tradition, and this goes back to the, I mean, this is one of the reasons Rick Rude never worked with Hogan because he knew that, you know, there was a limited shelf life of working Hogan. Uh, I, I think, you know, I think that's, they run the risk when you involve that guy who has that character and that contract of just, you know, doing a quick blow off that ends with a leg drop. Yeah. Uh, one more thing to discuss, Jeff. Um, Steve Mongo and Michael, we discussed him earlier in the show, but I did want a bit more of a formal chat about him on the end. Um, prospects, uh, so far, what are your thoughts on, on, on his kind of transition from announcer into kind of active performer? And what do you think a prospects are for him? And uh, is he going to be able to transfer that quote unquote NFL character into, into a wrestling ring while, while he, becomes competent as a wrestler. Uh, you know what? I think if, if, if you look at the kind of guy who he is and you build outwards from there, I mean, you're going character to, I mean, what's the old saying is like the bumps are the easy part. It's, it's getting, it's getting over. It's getting the character that's going to be the, the, the more challenging, uh, situation, uh, part, the more, the more challenging part. I apologize. Uh, I think with McMichael, the cool thing about him is he's got this cachet of having kind of been a badass amongst badasses. And I think, I mean, honestly, all he's going to have to do is a three-point stance shoulder tackle. I mean, if he could if he could get to a level of 1996 Duggan work rate, I think he'll be fine. He's got he's got such... I think he'll be more than fine if he can work a Duggan match. There you go. Well, there you go. I think I think that's what, that's what you need to get. And if you can put him across the ring with an Arn Anderson or a Chris Benoit or the Horseman, I mean, he has this... He let's put it like this: the, the '85 Bears were a team full of personality. Okay, Steve Mongo McMichael had personality within that locker room. Okay, so to understand and appreciate his value as a character, I mean, whether it's on commentary or as a bodyguard for, say, Savage, or to kind of do that type of thing, he's the wrestling. I mean, it sounds so kind of uh, cynical to say the wrestling secondary. But once the bell rings, that's that doesn't even matter. It's, in, in a promotion with Hulk Hogan on top, the wrestling is definitely secondary. Yeah, I think I think if you compare Lawrence Taylor to McMichael, because obviously, I mean, Taylor's an all-time great, and McMichael is a, a you know, he was a, a 14-year veteran, I believe, in the NFL, multiple Pro Bowl and Super Bowl winner uh, with the 85 Bears, which, I mean, I can't herald them enough as – awesome team if there's but, one thing i cannot go back and forth to you about is about the nfl i will just say i agree with no yeah. further comment well i mean like i said mcmichael's a character and i mean they call him mongo mcmichael i mean mongo is the crazy character from the blazing saddles film from the late 60s with mel you know a mel brooks movie i mean he's uh, he's based off of a crazy wild character his other nickname i believe in high school was bam bam because he's just he's He's a wild and crazy... You, you might end up with some WWF lawyers being touched about that. I know Bam Bam Bigelow probably owns the rights to his name, but... Get the WWF lawyers. I don't want Terry Gordy knocking down my door. You that, know, that as well. That, that's bad street, even for McMichael, okay? But, uh, no, I think I think 
I mean, whatever they get out of McMichael, I mean, he's in his late thirties now. He's, he's played an entire NFL career. So he's not coming in healthy. He's going to be banged up and banged up on an NFL level is huge. But I think, I think whatever they get out of him, he's, he's a barrel of laughs. He's fun. So if that can come across on screen, I think they're made. I think you said it best when you said the wrestling secondary. For for McMichael, his benefit to WCW isn't going to be about drawing people because they appreciate his work rate or because he can have a great 12-minute match. Hell, WCW isn't really about work rate, really. Um, it's really about can they put him in compelling stories that are going to get people sit up and go, hang on, McMichael's doing wrestling now. I'm going to tune into that. And that's really going to come down to his promo work, which I think on commentary, he's not a very good commentator. I'll say that. I, I don't think they're breaking any new ground on that. I think it really doesn't help. He's alongside Bischoff and, and Heenan. But while very entertaining, is kind of phoning it in. It's going to come down to his promos. And so far, he's been on point. The, the, yeah. promo, the promo with Savage was really good. The promo with Flair was really good. Didn't say that much, but when you're in an exchange with Ric Flair, you don't need to. You say your bit and you let Flair do the rest. Yep. If he and that's can, it. And the same will be in the ring, Bob. I mean, yeah. put him in the ring with Ric Flair. I mean, they. I mean, he's better than a broomstick. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, just just imagine, picture this: your WCW. You can get a Chicago arena in about six to eight months. You build a Flair Mongo feud and cap it off in Chicago where he's part of the most legendary Bears team. I mean, that just sells itself. I that, mean, there's that is immense. Because Flair could, Rick Flair could probably right now have a three and a half star match, well, a three star match with, with Mongo McMichael on the basis that it's just Rick Flair. And all Mongo's got to do is stand up and let Flair bump around him. Hell, guys have made careers out of less, right? And, and it, he can do that, and you're right, like the, the, the selling point for him is right now. No amount of Steve Mongo McMichael improving as a wrestler over the next 18 months is going to make a difference to his drawing power. It's going to be about one, how they present him now, and two, how they present the stories that he's in. Ultimately, providing you put him in the ring with decent guys, he's going to be fine. Um, and I must admit, having, you know, having also, this slightly like not seen, not really seen any of anything of him. He came in, heard him as an announcer. Yeah, bit up and down. You know, it helps with my audio introductions when the title changes. He will screams. There's a new world champion, which really helps me put together the intro for this show. Um, but other than that, he's a really up and down commentator. If his promos are as good, he's 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 going with flair. Like flair could probably carry me and you to a very competent feud right now. Um, and that's largely all that matters. Bryony's compelling character on air, people will tune in, and providing he's working with guys like Ric Flair, people will enjoy it. That's all that matters. And you're right. For a guy of his age that's done a full NFL career, he ain't going to have long. He ain't going to be working many house shows yet. He shouldn't, he shouldn't be, really. Like, the, the, the part of the attraction with McMichael is, oh, it's see McMichael in a wrestling ring. That ain't going to last either. He should wrestle next month, and then you're right. Return into the country booth, let Flair simmer, let that feud simmer for a while, have them interact every now and then, line up the Chicago show, as you say, and headline a pay-per-view with that match. If they do it right, that could be their biggest program of the year. I, I, I I don't, I, I really don't think that that's necessarily too out of the mark. Anyway, Lord knows how we've gone so long on this. We were meant to have Steve on this show. Uh, Steve, Steve, Steve's not on the show. We, we, we lost him for technical reasons. Um, but we've gone massively long. I mean, Jeff, it's just, it's always a pleasure having you on. And it probably was a good thing we didn't have Steve on in that we would be going till about midnight hour time. And God knows what time that is your time. Uh, a big thank you, Jeff, for coming on the show. Uh, tell people where they can find you on Twitter and anything else you want to say. Uh, well, thanks, Bob, as always. Um, Twitter's on, I'm on Twitter. Just find me through Bob. That's about the best way I can do. If you want to see the latest and greatest uh, analysis of MMA and pro wrestling and scary movies and Lord knows what else. Uh, <laughs> I've changed my Twitter a couple times just because for professional development reasons, I don't want to be identified. You, you, you don't want people that value you as a human being in a professional work environment to think you watch wrestling. That would be I, the I, end of the world. I think I think even more so than that, the number of adorable animal uh, Twitter retweets I do, you know. Uh, that too, that too, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. 
puppies all the time. I, it's just, it's kind of a, it's kind of, I, I am, I'm addicted to adorable animal videos. So, uh, no, I, anything that I can do to come on here and give my brilliant commentary, I'd love to do. And as always, Bob, it's a pleasure. No, absolutely. Uh, you are on Twitter. I think it's Jeff P R K E R. Is that right? You, yeah. I, you took the A out, which is like really going to flummox everyone who's trying to find you. Well, I mean, it's like I'm like the booty man. I mean, I got to change my identity so they don't figure out that I'm Brutus Beefcake. I think we figured that out. Uh, uh. I think so. I think so. Hey, <laughs> Jeff, always a pleasure. Um, yeah, yeah. Let, let, oh God, Libra, I hope for sure. Uh, yeah, full wine story this month. Uh, Jeff, at some stage, will be doing some stuff with us on the UFC side. We're just trying to work out the best kind of format for that on the base that Jeff isn't always available and whatever. But you will be hearing Jeff on on UFC shows in the future. Probably won't be hearing him on the next one we're doing. Uh, that is volume four of this month's show. We're taking that, I think, early June. So if you really have been shit hot and downloaded the show as soon as I download it, you won't be able to find it yet, but that'll be there soon. Uh, volume two is WWF. We talk about the curtain call. That's going to be a fun one. Uh, we've also got uh, In Your House 8, Beware of Dog. I haven't actually watched that yet, but that'll be a fun show to... Um, review show uh obviously that happened across two different nights uh volume three is ecw fun little show over there too um uh, and that's been that you can find me on twitter at bobby Bambit. you can find all the information you need on wrestling 20 yrs.com subscriptions blogs back episodes everything you need on there uh, if you're on itunes do leave us a rating and a review and until next time i have been bob bamba this has been volume one of the may 1996 edition of the wrestling 20 years ago podcast and until next time Goodbye.